which is per week. No, 33 billion a year. You don't know the figure per week. It's roughly 600 million. That's what I'm asking for. Do you know how that figure is composed? Yes, they looked at um, a series of uh, EU regulations and then they looked at the government's impact assessments of those. Yes. Are you aware that they only use the uh, costs but don't uh, seek to add up the benefits in order to arrive at that figure? I don't think that's accurate, actually. Then tell me what is. Um, the, uh, the vast majority of the costs... Um, so their, their methodology was, uh, they, they looked at all these things, they looked at the impact assessments, there are some benefits, but Open Europe's conclusion was that almost all the benefits didn't actually materialise, that the government claimed would happen. Um, have you looked carefully at the place at which they have said that the benefits may not materialise? Um, I've looked in their text. I've, I looked at the report a few months ago. I haven't looked at it since then. If you do so, you'll find that that remark refers only to um, the uh, benefits of the removal of uh, the costs and benefits of climate regulation, not of all regulation. I don't think that's true, actually. If you look at their, their website, it's not what it says on their website. Do you want me to read what it says on the website? By all means. It says it has the um, total cost, yeah. and it says Open Europe estimates that 95% of the benefits envisaged in the impact assessment have failed to materialise, quote, unquote. That's not referring just to energy, as you mentioned. It's referring to all of them. You'll find that that is the case, as I've described it. And in a moment I'll read it uh, out to you if you're still doubting. Which, if any, of these regulations, there are in fact a hundred of them, are worth keeping? The main point about our campaign is not to argue about the specifics of particular regulations. Of course there are individual regulations which are... Um, which almost all people would regard as uh, silly um, and are very likely to be removed after we vote leave. But in general, our campaign is not really about should we have more of this type of regulation or less of this type of regulation, should we have more environmental protection or not. It's much more about the more fundamental principle, which is who controls this regulatory system ultimately. Is it this parliament and our Supreme Court or not? So it's not, we, as a campaign, we don't have a list where we say we should definitely be in X percent of these top 100. Our point is broader. The, I am now looking at their document, and it is clear that this is only uh, a reference to climate targets. Um, but of course, uh, it's the same mistake that Boris Johnson made when he gave evidence. And it is possible, if you don't read it carefully enough, to grasp exactly what they do say. Well, I'm reading the paragraph, and it's not what it says here. Although, um, I think it, given the savings that you've given this figure, £600 million per week in your literature, it might be advisable that you offer a qualification for the rest of the literature you publish and make clear... Um, but that is all it is a reference to. Well, I'll send the committee a copy of the website um, that I've been printed off, uh, which does not say that on the Open Europe website. So perhaps there's two different documents on the Open Europe website, I don't know. But I shall certainly send the committee the copy of the document that I've been given, and then you can make your own minds out about it. That will be very helpful. Um, I'm just going to come back to the question I asked you a moment ago, which is what it is that you think of the regulations, there are in fact a hundred regulations that have been costed by Open Europe yeah. in order to create the 600 million figure that you think might be worth keeping? Um, I think that's not really the way, the, the, the way to look at it. And of course, the, 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 there's, there's a broader point as well, which is that um, one of the, uh, um, as some of the committee know, I worked in government for a few years in the Department of Education. One of the areas from EU regulation which was most destructive, which delayed public, uh, public buildings uh, by the most and cost billions, 
whereas the whole range of EU procurement, and EU procurement is not even touched on by Open Europe. One of the great benefits, largely undiscussed in the entire debate about, about voting to leave, is that we will be able to get out of these nightmarish procurement rules. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a big audit of them, suggested that it adds something like 30% to the cost of projects in 200 days. When you aggregate that over the entire public spending field, the hospitals, schools, aircraft carriers, you name it, you're talking about huge amounts of money, but the government unfortunately um, refuses to investigate this issue and there are no really concrete numbers on it. That will be one huge gain, but how many billions you would save is very hard to say. It's not really answering my question. I've had two goes so far. There's a hundred regulations out there, mm -hmm. which have uh, the uh, cost of which has been estimated and aggregated. And I'm asking you, uh, which of those regulations, in whole or part, you feel might have sufficient benefit to warrant being retained? Well, as, as not been able to give me a single example so far. Vote leave doesn't get. Vote leave doesn't um, doesn't run campaigns saying. Uh, get rid of this specific regulation. There are, there are very few things which we which we yes, focus on point, individually. Point Clinical trials directive is one um, where I think the the problems with it are so enormous that it's fairly obvious. You've got the whole field of Nobel Prize winning scientists saying for year after year this thing is crazy and it's killing people. Um, that's one example which I think most people would say should change. But generally speaking, we've, we've, we we don't we don't touch on that because it's not really our job to to to, to do that. Our campaign is much more about the fundamental principle of who controls this system. Do you think that it's likely that we would want to retain regulation to ensure that banks... Uh, Sorry, I, missed, I didn't hear what you said. Great Nation? Do you think it's likely that we would want to maintain regulation to ensure that banks are uh, appropriately capitalised? I think that uh, it, uh, so these, uh, these big investment banks drove the whole system off a cliff in 2008. I think that re re taking back control over the regulation of the banks and over vital issues such as capital requirements is crucial. I certainly would not trust that to the cesspit of Brussels lobbying uh, where Goldman Sachs has its people in there and its fingers in every pie. I think that this parliament should decide the rules on how banks like Goldman Sachs operate. Have you taken a look at the Capital uh, Requirements Directive? I have not examined it in detail. I know that, 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 that there are some people who say that actually in some ways what the EU has done on, in some of these areas has been sensible since the 2008 financial crisis. But that, of course, is not the main point. You don't think it likely that we will want to maintain a measure of higher capital requirements than we had in the run-up to the crisis. I think we should, certainly should do, and I certainly would not trust decisions on that to the European Commission, the European Court of Justice, and the Brussels lobbying system. The, uh, a substantial proportion of the figure for the cost of regulation, that is a substantial proportion of the £600 million pounds a day, is in fact the cost of uh, an estimate of the gross cost to banks uh, of fulfilling the terms of the capital requirements directive. You don't think it likely that we would want to carry on increasing risk-weighted assets for banks as we have been in the past under the provisions of, after all, this is all implementing only Basel III. Mm -hmm. This is uh, derived not ultimately from EU legislation but from a broader international agreement of which the EU forms a part. Well, you made a very important point there. One of the great advantages of voting to leave is that Britain will regain its seat in a lot of these international institutions where it's currently represented extremely badly by, the, by Brussels and will be able to argue for its case at the global level where increasingly the, these decisions are made, as you say in banking but in, in many other areas. Um, you see the same phenomenon. The world's very different than it was in 1985 when Cofield and Delors dreamt up their cunning scheme of the single market. Uh, the world's changed. Regulation is increasingly moving to the global level. It's a very good reason to vote leave. When Open Europe were asked to estimate what estimate they made of the annual saving it was feasible 
to conclude might be obtainable with the removal of that list of 100 regulations. Mm. They told us, and this is also published on their website, that the correct figure is not 33 billion, but 13 billion. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that? Wasn't aware of that, no, but as I said, the, the document anyway doesn't include all the costs of procurement, doesn't include all sorts of other costs of the European Union, so all of these, all of these numbers and all of these studies are on all sides of the campaign, in government, depending on one's point of view. Um, the methodology behind lots of these things is questionable. Uh, any, any, anyone who took any sort of rigorous approach to it, if you sat a bunch of physicists down and looked at all of these studies, there's almost nothing the economics profession Produces which would withstand any kind of sort of serious scientific scrutiny. So these numbers really are looking at sort of orders of magnitude, I think. And you've got the British Chambers of Commerce saying 60 billion, you've got Open Europe totting up numbers and saying 30 billion. What the true figure is, nobody knows, but it's giving you an indication of the sort of order of magnitude of the impact of what the European Union is doing. If nobody knows the true figure and you're saying um, that we should be working off orders of magnitude, it might be sensible, don't you think, to use the figure that Open Europe themselves say is the maximum feasible to use as the likely annual saving from uh, the removal of EU regulation. Well, what we'll probably be doing is uh, we'll produce something which brings together a lot of these different reports, the Open Europe report, the Chambers of Commerce, a lot of these different things, and says here is a range of different estimates, um, here is a reasonable way of looking at it, the methodology is what it is, uh, no one should take these things as any kind of specific indicator, but it gives you it gives you a rough idea. I mean, it's okay. similar in a way to the whole issue about how many what percentage of our laws are made by. by no, the we might come on to that in a moment. Year. But don't you think it might be a good idea to have done that work first, rather than now to be telling us that you might start to draw together a list of all these various well, we have all sorts of documents. costs and benefits of regulation. We have all sorts of documents and all sorts of briefing notes. We're very happy to send you a copy of one that has all of these things laid out if you would like. So what you're saying is that there's a range of numbers. We shouldn't take any particular number that you're using as a headline number, and you are using the £600 million per week, the, three, uh, the £33 billion per annum cost of regulation all the time in your literature. You're now telling us, I think, in evidence that we should... Uh, set that at a heavy discount, not give ourselves too much, uh, not worry about it too much or its accuracy because it's just one of a range of numbers that might be taken into consideration. Have I got right to roughly summary speak, your evidence? Roughly speaking, what you're saying, I think, is a reasonable perspective. As I said, all the, cam all, uh, the campaigns on both sides and the government produce these economic studies that have various numbers. Anyone who takes decimal points seriously in these things, I think, it, 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 it's crazy. Um, well, this is a decimal method, point that's the moving along quite a long way, isn't it? I mean, what we're talking about... There's a decimal point in the, in the open... We're talking in the about a decimal figure. point that shifted quite a bit from 33 billion to 13 billion at a stroke. Or, f or to 60 billion, according to the Chambers of Commerce. Yes, I'm just taking a look at the figures that you've used as your headline figures... We use all sorts of for figures. ...for your literature. There are some figures more prominent than others. And I have to say, some of the figures you're now saying we should set at greater store than others, and it's really up to us to pick and choose. It sounds to me as if we might do well not to pick or choose any of them. I'd like to move on to EU contributions. How much is Britain contributing per year to the EU budget? Uh, according to the ONS, it's... Um I think it's 19.7 billion, 19.1 billion. You are aware that there is a rebate in place, don't you? I am aware there's a rebate. Yeah. Do you know how much the rebate is? Um, the rebate is um, three or four billion, I think. It's six billion. Um, the, uh, are you aware what happens to the rebate? Yes. Physically. Perhaps you'd like to describe that to the committee. I think the interesting thing about the rebate is I've just asked you to describe what happens to the rebate. I'd be what happens to the rebate you are is aware of what happens to the rebate, so I'd now like you to describe it. What happens to the rebate is that there's an enormous row constantly between Britain and Europe about how much of our money we get back. 
and we lose these arguments and we get some of this money back uh, in a very unpredictable way. If you look at how the accounts are done by the ONS, one of the reasons why they look at the, uh, the, the actual figure, unlike the Treasury, not the estimated figure is, they have to work out the rebate in arrears to find out where on earth the negotiation got to. Okay. What I'm asking you, perhaps it's my fault for not being precise enough, there is a sum of money, £19 billion pounds a year, uh, there's a rebate... That is debited from the UK government, yes. That is, you think, debited from the UK government. So what I think is the ONS fund. It's how the ONS defines it itself. Right. It's not, in fact, uh, uh, debited from the Consolidated Fund. Six billion of it never leaves the Consolidated Fund. It is, fund. in fact, debited. That's exactly what the ONS says. If you don't like that, then you should argue with the ONS, not with me. I'm just telling you that it never leaves the UK. The it's, debited from, it's debited from the, the UK. UK for the whole of this period. It never leaves the UK, it never crosses the exchanges. When you're sitting in your slippers talking to Mrs Tyree and you're looking at your bank statements, and you look at your bank statement and it says X amount of money is debited from your account, that means it's gone from your account, doesn't it? It's pretty clear what that means. And the debiting is exactly what the ONS says here. It is debited from the UK. Table 9.9 .9 of the ONS, that's what it says. As I've just explained to you, and I used to work in the Treasury, and I was in the Treasury shortly after the Fontainebleau Agreement was negotiated, this money never leaves the Treasury. And I think it's quite significant, therefore, that uh, we should work off figures uh, that have some plausibility. Nineteen billion is not the figure that we pay across the exchanges. We pay thirteen billion. Across the exchanges. We are debited 19.1 billion according to the Office for National Statistics. That's an accounting procedure, but the money never leaves the UK, Mr. Cummings. What happens, what happens on your bank statement when you're debited? 19 pounds. That means you're debited 19 pounds. That's what the ONS says we're debited. 19.1 billion. How much of the EU's expenditure in the UK do you think we would? we, the UK, after Brexit, would want to continue with. How much of the what, sorry? I didn't touch How much of the EU expenditure that takes place in the UK do you think we would want to continue with after Brexit? Well, of course, similarly to the regulatory issue, it's not, it's not for vote leave to say, to, to say what should happen. Our fundamental argument is that it's up to, we should become a normal self-governing democracy again, and that it should be up to elected representatives to have these arguments. Um, I think there are some areas where all sensible people would say that um, after we vote leave on the 23rd of June, we don't want a whole load of cliff edges with funding. Um, I have a particular interest in science, for example. Um, it would be crazy suddenly to stop a, a huge amount of science funding uh, as soon as we leave. Um, so I think that a lot of the money which currently is spent by the EU in this country, we would continue some of it permanently, some of it temporarily. In some areas, I would hope that the British government, freed from the nightmare of Brussels, would actually choose to spend more money. But that would be up to the democratic government of the day. You said it's not for you as an organisation to say what would happen, but you have said what you think should happen in a number of areas, haven't you? You've said we will pay farmers at least as much as they get now. And that's I'm reading from your website. You have said there will be financial protection for all groups that now get money from Brussels. I'm quoting again from your website. That does sound to me like an organisation that is saying what it thinks should happen to this money. Well, we're saying that, 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 that um, there are various MPs who've spoken uh, at events we've had. George Eustace, for example, spoke about, about farming and the problems that he sees every day with the, with the um, CAP system. And he suggested that uh, various ways in which the uh, in which you would deal with the uh, with the EU payment system once after we vote leave. Um, so we've given some indications, but we haven't given a, a sort of specific um, detailed budget because we don't really think it's our it's our role to. But I do think it's important. We think it's important to assure groups such as the Royal Society and to um, farmers um, that none of the serious people who are likely to be part of the next government 
and who are thinking about this in a position to take decisions on it uh, are, are arguing for um, some kind of big cliff edge where suddenly this money is taken away. I think that's a sensible... Wh wh whichever side of the argument you're on, it seems like a sensible way forward not to um, have any kind of jarring uh, process with funding. But we are agreed, aren't we, that where, where you say there will be financial protection for all groups that now get money from Brussels, there will be a sum of money, a cost of that financial protection. Certainly, of course. Right. Have you made an estimate of what that might be? No, because it depends on exactly what, what the government of the day decides, decides to do and exactly how it decides to do it. It hasn't interfered with your decision to carry on using the £350 million a week figure for grace EU contributions, has it? I mean, bearing in mind that we're not going to get anything like that sum, are we, if we're going to continue with all this financial protection? Bearing in mind that we are debited £19.1 billion a year according to the ONS, then that sum will be ours to spend as we wish after the 23rd of June. The truth is that you are spending quite a lot of this money even before you've got it back, aren't you? You're telling people, for example, that um, there are opportunities for extra money here to be spent in the NHS. Aren't you? Certainly. But once we stop being debited 19.1 billion a year, then there's a lot of money to go around. That doesn't even touch all of the other costs, for example, that the, that the, that the EU imposes, as I said before. I, imagine what will happen to the school building programme, and I know this from personal experience working with Michael Gove and Department of Education. There will be billions over a decade saved in school building programme once we are free of the, uh, of the horrific EU procurement rules. And that figure is not included. If, you know, our, the 350 million quid a week figure that we use is, a, is an underestimate of the savings that we will make from leaving the European Union, not an overestimate. Oh. What do you reckon the right number might be? I don't know, but I guess I would say tens of billions at least more than the, um, more than the 350 million uh, a week figure that we well, use. Well, let's, let's work off annual figures so we can... We've got, a three, we've got a 33 million figure. Uh, do, you, do you want to do a firm estimate while we're in the, in the, in the committee? Or or we're, you, we're, you want to take or, the procurement? Or we're, or we're talking about the 19 billion figure from the money that crosses, uh, the, the 13 billion that crosses the exchanges and the 19 billion that's identified in the ONS as a gross contribution. Which, exactly. which figure do you think we're actually going to save here, Mr Cummings? Well, I think that we will, at the very least, we will end the debit of 19.1 billion, which is a good start. But now we'll we're talking about tens of billions. We'll be, we'll, we're just trying we'll, to get a feel for how many we'll, more tens of billions. So that's 20 billion. That's a, that's a good start. You've then got the EU procurement rules. You've got EU energy costs. You've got all sorts of, all, I mean, there's huge amounts of ways in which the European Union costs us money. Um, at some point in the campaign, certainly, we'll be totting all of these up and we'll certainly send you a copy of the, of the, of the full bill. Why are you suggesting that you might want to advocate the whole of the £350 million per week uh, that you say will be saved uh, to the NHS? Some of our supporters do. We have Labour supporters such as Gisela Stewart and Graham I'm not Springer. suggesting some of your supporters do. I'm suggesting you do as an organisation. Why are you as an organisation doing this? We are saying that, we, that so we often use the figure of 350 billion, which is an underestimate. Of the actual figure is million. 350 million, sorry. And so sorry. It, and the actual number is 367.4 million. But for, so as we weren't misleading anybody, we rounded it down to 350 million. I'm just asking you uh, why you're end, suggesting in some of your literature that you might allocate all of that to extra spending on hospitals. As an organisation, you are proposing that. As an organisation, we're saying that once we stop the 19.1 billion debit, then we will have £350 million pounds a week, roughly speaking, to spend on our priorities, like the NHS. And the NHS is oh. country's top priority, and I'm it's a fairly the, obvious target you, for where a lot of these savings would be spent. I'm asking you the same question a third time. You have made it clear you think there are a number of other priorities that you personally might want to spend money on, such as science, and you've agreed that a number of other groups are going to get financial protection. 
Mm. Why have you nonetheless persisted with the idea that the same pot can be raided and used exclusively for the NHS? That's what I'm asking you. No, we're not. We're saying we, we've, we, we've uh, said... We, I, have, I have here one of your posters that's available and you're encouraging your supporters to download. Mm. And, uh, I think it gives a clear enough message. Yes, uh, very clear message. Person, I hope the TV comes to see. I'm telling you uh, that we should give the whole of this $350 million a week to the NHS, doesn't it? We could certainly say we could certainly give the NHS a very large proportion of that, but it, but, but also remember there's all the, the other money that we've saved as well. That's, there's not just the 350 million pounds a week from the that we save from the budget. So we're going to put there's all, all the other money 350 million into the NHS, and then we're going to fund all these other things that you're keen on, the science and the other and the other financial protection you're going to provide to all the groups who now get their money from Brussels from another pot as yet unspecified. As, uh, actually, as specified a few different examples of where, of where the pot comes from. Energy regulation and EU procurement rules being one, being two alone, which offer billions. There's more than enough billions to go around to put an awful lot more money into the NHS and protect science and protect agriculture and still have billions left over. Hmm. Billions left over. This sounds like Aladdin's cave to me. I, I, I just want to touch on one more point. You are... Um, saying in hospitals, in your literature, aren't you, uh, that we can give a lot more money to hospitals? You're distributing literature to that effect. You are doing that, aren't you? No, we are not. We're not distributing any literature to hospitals whatsoever. So I have a piece of literature here with your logo. This is a pirated piece of literature. It says, vote, leave, take control. Uh, it's badged up as your literature. It, it looks says, like... It says, help protect your local hospital. Yep. And it's got here at the bottom, uh, vote leave, uh, vote leave take control dot mm -hmm. org. Is that not your organisation? It looks very... It looks like it's one of our leaflets, yes. Okay. So you are distributing these things to hospitals. This was picked up from Guy's mm -hmm. Hospital. Well, it was picked up from guys. So I saw that story in the paper as well. Well, not in the paper. I think it was on the website. Well, I have one of the leaflets here. Yeah. Yes, we. I saw that story on the website. I think last week. Um, we haven't got a clue where that's come from. Certainly wasn't done by. Uh, certainly wasn't done by us. Um, so this is a pirate. No. Well, I have no idea. I very much doubt it. Uh, but but you're asking how? Oh, is hang on. I just want clarity. I'm giving you clarity. Please you haven't yet. I don't, we'll we'll have a go. I've got many of them points I've been asking really, but let, let me just go through some very simple questions. Go for it. Did your organisation print this leaflet? It looks, it looks likely that we did, but obviously I can't tell about any individual leaflet. So you don't know what leaflets might be printed by your organisation? You're running a campaign and you don't no, know... I'm sorry, I think, you, I think you're misunderstanding what, what, what I'm saying. If you're saying... No, I, I, if you're asking about I, that... I, I don't think you're under, understanding the question. I'm asking a straightforward simple questions. Yes. We really are getting down to very simple <coughs> questions. Is this one of a leaflet of your organisation? Do you mean that design of leaflet or do you mean that individual leaflet? I'm asking you <laughs> if this leaflet is one of your organisation's leaflets. Yes, it is. It is. As I said, so start we with. have arrived at a... We've answered question one. In, we've <laughs> arrived at question one. Now let's try question two. Um, do you think uh, that it is reasonable that somebody might misconstrue this leaflet at first glance as a leaflet produced by the NHS, since it has an NHS logo in the top right-hand corner. No, it says vote, leave, take control on the bottom of that logo. OK. W what do you make of that logo there, that NHS logo? What do, you, what do I make of it? Well, do you think it looks like the logo of the NHS? Looks roughly like it from here. Yes. Well, it looks roughly like it from almost any distance. Here is an NHS document uh, encouraging you to eat better food. And you'll see that the logo is strikingly similar. In fact, they're almost identical. It takes an expert eye to tell that the one is not the other. Um, one of them is italicised slightly. One of them is not. Uh -huh. um, do you 
now that you've had a chance to consider whether you did in fact produce this leaflet, and you've now agreed that it does look like an NHS leaflet at any reasonable distance, do you think it might be a good idea to think twice about putting out literature as misleading as this? No, not, I certainly don't. I think you're confused about what my answer was before. You, you were, I thought you were asking me, is the leaf that you're holding in your hand being put into a hospital, has that come from us? And I was saying, no, it hasn't come from us. As in, we did not distribute leaflets to the hospital. We are as baffled as everyone else about the story that appeared on the website. That hasn't happened because of us. hasn't happened in my direction. No the office knows why it's happened. That's what I was saying. If you're saying you've got one of the leaflets from that hospital and you're holding it up in front of me and saying, is this yours? My answer is, it looks like it's something that we've printed, but it's certainly not something that we've put into, I think you said Guy's Hospital or Thomas's Hospital, or we've had the same thing, I'm not sure. Okay. Crystal. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to uh, start by asking about the costs and benefits of membership of the single market. Um, You've published some figures in which you've assessed the sort of net cost or benefit of the single market. Can you tell the committee, um, just in summary, what the conclusion of those figures was? So which, which document are you talking about? Uh, a briefing titled, um, The Single Market is Failing British Business. You'll have to give me a sure. copy of it if you want me to. Okay, so it, so it says... It. It says There's the, all sorts of briefings all over, so I don't... I'm I think we've established that already. It says the benefits of single market membership are £37 billion and the cost of the UK's membership fee and 66, not 100, 66 single market regulations are 41.7 and you've subtracted one from the other to say that the costs less the benefits are £4.5 billion per year. Is that for, so you're suggesting that the, there is a net cost of single market membership of £4.5 billion a year. I think from what you're reading out that um, actually what you're looking at is a bit of research in which we said, let's take not our estimate of the single market benefits, but what the European Commission's best mm -hmm. estimate is of the single market's benefits, and then look at the Open Europe's cost of regulations. If you give me a copy of the document, I'll be able to confirm it easily if you want me to, but I, for, from what you're reading out, that sounds like it. I.e., that's not our estimate of the single market's benefits, that's what the European Commission claims itself. So you've come up with a negative number, minus 4.5 billion. Does that mean that whether we're in or out of Europe, you want nothing to do with the single market because you think it has a negative effect? How do you define the single market? The single market, the end of the, the trading um, market that exists in which European Union members and, I think, Norway are currently members of. Well, of course, the single, the single market is not a trading arrangement. That's not what it's helpful single market if you is. answer questions rather than ask them, but do, if you want to give us an answer to the question you yourself posed, uh, I'm sure we'd be interested to hear from So do you think, you, you're suggesting that our single market membership carries a, carries a cost of £4.5 billion pounds per year. Does that mean you think we should not be part of the single market? So, as I said before, we're, taking, we're saying, even if you take the Commission's most optimistic prediction of what the benefits are, and you take a reasonable uh, assessment of some of the costs of it, you still get a negative number, uh, and that tells you something. If you look at the overall economic analysis over the last 30 years, people have not been able to come up with any convincing numbers on the benefits of the single market. In fact, intra-EU trade has gone backwards We're coming on to that, we're coming on to that in a minute. We're coming single on to that market. But you, so you're suggesting this, this minus 4.5 billion may even be a worse figure than that. But you're not, you're not True figure, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure it will be worse than Fine. that. Fine. Yeah. So does that mean, this is really a yes no question, um, does that mean you think we should not be a member of the single market, whether in or out of Europe? What do you mean by the single market? I mean the single market which we currently trade in and which Norway trades in. It's a yes or no question. Do you think we should be a member part of the single market or not? The single market is defined by the European Union as including membership of the euro and membership of Schengen. Well, so that, is, well that isn't true because we're currently so members of it and we're, ni we're neither euro members nor Schengen members, so that clearly isn't true. Exactly. That's the, that's the point. But that's how the, European, that's how the European Commission and the European Court of Justice define the single market. Well... We're currently members of it, and that's not how it's operating. It's a very simple question, which you're persistently refusing to answer. No, Do you think you're confused about what the single market is? Should we, should, look, we are currently a member of it. Norway is currently a member of it. Other EU members are members of it, whether or not they use the euro. It's a very simple question. Do you think we should be a member of the part of the single market or not? Yes or no? 
The single market is a political project from Jacques Delors, and it encompasses both Can you economic... Can the question, yes or no? I'm answering the question. It encompasses economic and monetary union, and it encompasses the Schengen area, and it encompasses all sorts of other things, including procurement rules, which have nothing to do with trade. Then can you explain to me how come, we're part, then how come we're part of the single market? Then how come we're part of the single market without being part of Schengen and without being part of the euro? If what uh, you say is true. Well, it's not a question of if, if what I'm saying is true. It's a legal definition in the treaty. Do you want me to read it out to you? What then how come we're part... So, so you're saying the UK is not part of the single market currently? No. You're misunderstanding what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the European Union itself defines the single market as including economic and monetary union and a, a, an area without internal frontiers, i.e. the Schengen area. Then what, then we are already not part of two of the biggest aspects of the single market. And they are two aspects of the single market, which in my opinion, and the opinion of many people, are very, very damaging. Other people have taken a different view. The chairman of this committee was a very firm supporter of the euro and the ERM. Other people have different attitudes towards different aspects of the single market project. Okay. We in fact, I, as a matter of fact, I was an opponent of joining the ERM when we did, and, <coughs> and uh, I've never been a firm supporter of the right. Euro project either, but don't let it worry you, Dominic. It's, it sounds as if you're as fast and loose with those facts as you are with all the other facts you've so when right, I'm right, asking so far this afternoon. Thank you, Chairman. When I'm asking about the single market, I mean the ability to trade freely in goods and financial services within Europe, which we, the United Kingdom, currently do, despite the fact we're not members of the euro, nor are we signatories to Schengen. Do you think, you think that that's this arrangement for the UK, costs us for at least four and a half billion, and maybe more per year? Do you think we should continue to be part of that arrangement? Yes or no? Quote, even the strongest advocates of EMU will be hard put to argue that it would do better than the ERM, unquote. That's from Andrew Tyree, the chairman so, of the committee. Respect, I wasn't asking about what Andrew so, said 25 years ago. So I'm just answering the point that the chairman of the committee made, that he didn't think the ERM was, wasn't a support of the ERM, and I'm just pointing out what the chairman of the committee said. If you're asking me about the single market, yes, as I've explained, there are two major features of the single market, the euro and Schengen, which are very damaging. There are lots of other areas of the single market which are damaging. Overall, Vote Leave thinks that the single market project has been bad for Europe and bad for Britain. Do you think single market access, as we currently have it, as, so I'm being very precise now, the UK has single market access currently today, right? You think it costs us four and a half billion or more per year. Do you think we no, should... No, that's not what we said. Well, you think it costs us money, right? You think, it's, you think it has a negative Correct. cost. Right, okay, fine. We can argue about the amount later. Do you think we should continue with single market access as we currently, as the United Kingdom currently has it? Definitely not, because single market access as we currently have is extremely damaging. The single market access that we currently have forces us to implement the clinical trials directive, which kills an unknown number of people every year because we can't test cancer drugs properly. That's stupid. We'll be much better off when we're outside things like that. Okay, okay so you, you finally said you don't want to be in the single market. Okay, that took quite a long time, but I've got there. Um, your, the figures you've quoted, the, the illustrative 4.5 billion, which you think is very conservative, um, you've arrived at that, as I've said, by taking the uh, cost of 66, not the 100 we talked about before, but 66 um, regulations costing, um, according to you or Open Europe, 22.6 <laughs> billion a year, and you've added to that the 19.1 billion uh, gross EU figure that you mentioned before. You add those together, you get the 41.7. Is it not misleading? To quote, to use the full 19.1 billion, when six billion of that never even leaves the UK's bank account. And in fact, were you to exclude that six billion, which seems reasonable because we never actually pay it out of our bank account, in fact, there'd be a positive number, not a negative one. No, I think you've confused the numbers. Um, as I explained before, the Office of National Statistics says 19.1 billion a year is debited from the UK. That's not me saying it. It's not Vote Leave saying it. It's the Office of National Statistics. If you don't like their definition of debit, then you should take that up with the ONS. But with, so if you're, if you're, you may be talking about debited in an accounting sense. It, it, there is a simultaneous credit of £6 billion, and in terms of cash physically going out of our national bank account, only, thir only 13, 13 billion um, crosses the border and goes to Brussels. No, but then you're using this argument about the rebate, which, ha which, which has no proper purchase. In what sense? Well, because the rebate, the, the, the rebate is not just our money. The rebate is something that has to be argued over, and the, and the European Union often says that we don't have it. I'll quote, I'll quote the guy who's running the in campaign. It is not a unilateral decision of the British Treasury or the British government to just say, quote, this is our rebate, we're entitled to it, pay up, unquote. 
The way this works and has always worked is there is a negotiation with the European Commission. That is a direct quote from the Chancellor of Exchequer and the guy who's running the campaign to this committee. We don't have to ask them to pay up. We simply don't give it to them. We just deduct it at source. We pay them 13, not 19. Wrong. That's not what the Chancellor says. We pay the fact is we pay them 13, not 19. That's not what the Chancellor says. If that's true, then you should bring the Chancellor back and ask why he's misled this committee, because it's not what he told you. I think I know he's misleading the committee. Right, you mentioned intra-EU EU trade earlier, so let's just talk about that. Your website um, says that the EU's own figures since 1999, um, and you repeated it a few moments ago, shows intra-EU trade has declined. Can you just comment on those figures and where they come from? Uh, I think there's been... Over the years, I've seen all sorts of studies on this. The, the, the Fed in New York did a big study a couple of years ago about it. Um, there are lots of different numbers floating around, but they all show the same, uh, the same rough picture. From when we joined the economic community in the 70s, uh, our trade... Well, that's about 1999. You, your, your website refers to 1999, and that's the period to today, and that's, the, that's what I'm asking about. You say that since 1999, intra-EU trade has slightly declined. I'm just asking you to tell me where those figures come from and what the, what the figures are. In fact. You're asking me to say... Yeah. I'm asking you to say where those figures come from and, and what they are. You're saying well, you've got a document in front of you, not me, so... Well, I've, got your, on, well I've, got, I've got your quote from your website. Um, I don't know where it came from, which is why I'm asking you. You can enlighten me. There'll be European Commission figures or Treasury okay. figures or ONS figures, okay. whichever. We can, I can send well, you. I've if you make a note of it, I'll send you the exact source for it. Well, well I'm I'm that would be really helpful if you make yeah. a note of it. <laughs> so I've got, I'm looking at figures from um, Eurostat, which perhaps you um, don't think is reliable, but anyway, um, which shows that in nominal terms, intra EU trade between 1999 and last year grew from uh, 1.5 trillion. To three trillion, so in nominal terms it doubled. In real terms, so in just for inflation, um, it was 2.2 to three, so that's a 40, 39% increase. Even as a share of GDP, um, it grew. So the most sort of conservative possible way of defining it, it grew from 17.2 to 20.8. So on any measure, nominal, real, or as a proportion of GDP, GDP intra-EU trade grew in the period 1999 to 2015? Well, you've got, you've got that set of figures. As I said, I'll provide you um, detailed sourcing for where the other ones come from. We, we always use official figures, so they'll be from the Treasury or the ONS or, 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 or whichever. The fundamental story is, it, since the creation of the single market is clear. It was sold as a project that would lead to a huge boost in intra-EU trade, which hasn't materialised. Trade, it hasn't been for Britain, it hasn't even materialised between Germany, France, Italy, the core of the, the, core of the Eurozone. Well, according so, to this, it's gone up by 39% in real terms. Well, I think you're looking at the wrong figures. But I beg your pardon? I think you're looking at the wrong figures. Well, you better raise that with Eurostat, because they come from Eurostat. Uh, we'd be interested, I think, to see any alternative figures, should they exist. Certainly. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just ask, I think one of my colleagues will be asking about um, <coughs> post-Brexit trade arrangements with the, Euro with the remainder of the European Union. Um, I'd like to ask, if I may, Chairman, one or two questions about post-Brexit trade arrangements with non-EU countries, so the rest of the world. So um, you're, too, you're too clever and quick for me. I can't really follow that. So, so okay, yeah. I'll, I'll try again. So one of my colleagues, I think, in due course, will ask about post-Brexit trade arrangements with the rest of the EU. Yes. I'd like to ask one or two questions about post-Brexit trade arrangements with the rest of the world. So not the EU, but the rest of the world. Right. Um, what is your um, sort of, uh, what's the word, straw man or, or, or proposed vision for how our post-Brexit trade arrangements with the rest of the world might unfold? What do you think will happen if we leave? After we leave, we will be outside the EU's common commercial policy. We will regain the power to make our own trade deals. We will regain the independent voice in the World Trade Organization. Uh, at the moment, obviously, we are represented in the World Trade Organization and in global trade talks by a European Commission which is dominated by France and by French interest, which has scuppered many an attempt to expand international trade over the years. Um, once we take back control of that ourselves, then we'll be in a much stronger position to, uh, to uh, expand free trade, to push generally for a more open trading system in the world. And do you think we have the, um, the British Civil Service, has the, uh, which obviously you've worked closely with in the past, has the institutional capability to do that? Do you think it's, do you think it's high enough calibre? 
Uh, I think that um, I think Whitehall. I've written about this extensively. I think there are uh, huge problems with how Whitehall operates these days. I think there are uh, huge problems with the diversion of clever people away from Whitehall. Uh, I would certainly would not be confident now with the Foreign Office uh, um, and the rest of Whitehall negotiating almost or, or, almost anything. We've seen what an appallingly cack-handed job they've just done of the last EU negotiations. A lot of these guys can't negotiate their way out of a paper bag. So. In the short term, no, there'd have to be a huge amount of work done in order to in order for people to raise their game. Yeah, Tim, you made all kinds of comments about them, um, saying that they're um, you think they um, they want to run the country, but they can't run their own diaries. Um, you said they've got the wrong people with bad education and no Correct. training, and you said it's uh, it's a bureaucratic system gone wrong, so duff people are promoted. So uh, exactly so. To to rely on these people to negotiate annual arrangements seems like a bit of a bit of a stretch. Well, vote leave, vote leave is only, uh, when we vote leave, it's only, it's only one part of a general process of national renewal, which, is, which, which we need. And as I've also written on many occasions, um, it, it would be very foolish to think that simply voting to leave the European Union, repealing the 1972 European Curious Act, is going to solve all our problems, mm. um, like some sort of Damocles that comes down, and with one chop, everything is, is solved. That obviously is not going to happen. There are profound problems with modern Whitehall. Uh, with the training selection uh, of uh, senior decision makers is, is, generally speaking, appalling. Okay. Which, who would be top of your list for a bilateral um, post-Brexit trade negotiation, ex-EU? I think, I think um, a, a, an obvious start would be uh, to look at which of the countries that we currently have the closest relations with in general. Since shortly after 1945, um, we've had the closest relations we've had with countries have been with um, uh, the uh, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the uh, the Five Eyes intelligence sharing agreements. They're at the core of so the US. security. US would be top of the list, right? Biggest biggest economy in the world. Those five countries are, are an obvious beginning. Are an obvious beginning. We have deep ties with them historically. Got they it. have the same common law system that we do, unlike all so, the So, are you at all? I got it. Okay, US. So, are you at all um, deterred or, or disheartened um, by um, a comment made by Michael Froman, uh, who is the US Trade Representative, who said, and I'm quoting, um, "We're not particularly in the market for free trade agreements with individual countries. We're building platforms that other countries can join over time." So he doesn't see, Mr. Froman doesn't seem, um, it sounds like he's not going to be terribly receptive to our overture. No, not worried. We've been in the EU for 40 years. The EU's made zero progress with, with, with any kind of sensible trade agreement. They're now in the process of creating this awful hybrid uh, of TTIP, which is not a proper free trade agreement, uh, and is aiming to prop up the interests of various multinational corporations which shouldn't be propped up. Um, after we vote leave, we'll be able to negotiate uh, directly with America, Australia, these countries. These are our, our friends. Uh, these have been our friends over 200 years. Uh, this will be much simpler for us to negotiate these things than it will be via the, uh, the French middleman in, in Brussels, which has scuppered trade deal Isn't the current trade commissioner of Brit? We all, know, we all know that the trade negotiations have been dominated by the French for 50 years, and in that it's the case now. It's why the recent negotiations with India were scuppered yet again over the French film industry, which happens once every, I don't know, sort of once every seven years or something. It's a tradition. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. We've established that um, both leave don't want to be part of the single market. Um, I'll pass the floor back. I think, most, I think most of the members of this committee don't want to be part of the Euro and part of the Schengen, at least now, if not beforehand. So uh, I don't think that's exactly a controversial position. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, Mr Cummings, your colleague um, Matthew Elliott said that um, for an EU referendum it would be far more preferable to have two clearly defined options. For such a momentous decision, voters deserve concrete alternatives with clear definitions Sorry, allowing... I didn't hear what you said. Voters deserve... For an EU referendum it would be far more preferable to have two clearly defined options. For such a momentous decision, voters deserve concrete alternatives with clear definitions, allowing the debate to be about two precise positions, thereby reducing the scope for mudslinging and the spread of misinformation. So can we, Mr Cummings, assume that clarity from your side is imminent on what that alternative would be? 
Um, I think Michael Gove was pretty clear yesterday about all sorts of things. That once we vote to leave, we will end the supremacy of European Union law, we'll end the supremacy of the European Court of Justice. In time, we'll repeal 1972 European Communities Act, particularly Section 2 of it. We will end the free movement of people in particular. We will have a different arrangement with, with Europe. We will take back control of trade. We will end the the menace of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which gives the ECJ power to rule on practically anything that they want to from now on. Um, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty clear but agenda. Even today, it's not, it's not even a controversial today, picture either. Even today, uh, Mr. Cummings, uh, we haven't had clarity, for example, on uh, whether this um, uh, money that you believe would be um, saved would go on the National Health Service, would go on farmers, would go on science funding, for example. So it's I think it would be fair to, to say we're lacking... All these great causes. Uh, sorry, if I finish the question. Uh, so it seems even today we are lacking that clarity on what life outside the European Union would look like. I don't think so. I think Michael Gove was pretty clear, it was pretty clear yesterday. But, of, of course... The fundamental heart of the argument of the European Union is, are we going to be a normal self-governing democracy or are we not? And if you are a normal self-governing democracy, by definition, the public make choices in elections and vote in or out people like you with your priorities and the chips fall where they may. So, of course, one can't say this is what the future will be exactly, this is how things will work out. That's not the point of it. The point of it is not for us to say, here's our blueprint of what Britain should be like in any detailed way. The most important thing about the, uh, 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 about the EU is not any individual policy. It's institutions for error correction. Do you have a system in which you can correct errors quickly, learn from things fast, adjust, which has been one of the great strengths of the Anglo-American system over 200 years, or do you have a system in which bureaucrats and a judicial system entrench ideas in a bureaucracy which is extremely slow to move, change, adjust, adapt to errors. Clinical trials directive is a classic example. Ten years of Nobel scientists saying it kills people, nothing happens. If we look specifically, Mr Cummings, at the macroeconomic impact of Brexit, will the Vote Leave uh, campaign be setting out their analysis of the macroeconomic impact of leaving the European Union? We will, but we won't be indulging in publishing any of the snake oil, um, quote, models, unquote, that the Treasury published. No, it's, Charlotte, it's, 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 it's the work of charlatans. So when will you be publishing that macro um, um, economic impact and who will be doing it? We'll be publishing all sorts of things on the macroeconomic impact of leaving, but we won't be publishing these spurious numbers like 4,300... I've heard, pounds. Mr Cummings, what you won't be publishing, but what will you be publishing? We're publishing all sorts of analysis about international trade and how we think how, how we think things will improve. A um, macroeconomic uh, impact assessment is not just about international trade; it's about GDP, inflation, the currency, mm -hmm. uh, productivity, all those range of issues. So, what I'm asking, Mr. Cummings, and if the answer is no, you could just tell us that. Will the Vote Leave um, campaign be setting out their analysis of the macroeconomic impact of Brexit? We will set out our analysis of the macroeconomic impact of Brexit, but it won't look like the spurious documents I've heard, that came Mr. Cummings, what you won't be doing. What I'm asking is what will you be publishing? I think I'll answer the question. Of course, we will be publishing that. And I also asked uh, Mr. Cummings who will be doing that analysis for you. You'll find out when we publish. And when do you intend uh, to you publish it, Mr. Cummings? You'll find that out when you publish it. We don't publish our grid for everyone to look at in the campaign. OK. Well, I look forward to reading it when it becomes um, available. Vote Leave said in um, recently that um, it would be exposing the false claims and scaremongering of Bank of England Governor Mark Carney and Deputy Governor Sir John um, Cunliffe. This seems like as good an opportunity uh, as any to do that. Uh, so, for example, do you think that the Governor's comment that Brexit was the biggest domestic risk to financial stability was an attempt at scaremongering? Um, there are lots of things... Excuse me. <clears throat> there are lots of things which the Bank of England has said recently which are... <clears throat> which are uh, scaremongering, yes. I heard I was campaign director of the, of the anti-euro campaign 15 years ago. I heard all of this stuff back then. The skies will fall, there'll be plagues... I'm not robots. asking about something that happened 15 years ago, Mr Cummings. Um, I'm asking about the recent comments that um, Bank of England, Mark Carney, made at this committee uh, that Brexit was the biggest domestic risk to financial stability. 
Do you believe that those comments from the Bank of England Governor were scaremongering? I do not think they were wise. Do you believe they are scaremongering? I've just said, I'll use my own words. I don't think they were wise. I don't think they are accurate. I, I think that the Governor of the Bank of England has made all sorts of mistakes in how he's intervened in this debate. But I also think he's entitled to, 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 to share his view with people. Of course, other distinguished figures, such as Mervyn King, have given a very different picture of what they think on these issues. The reason, uh, Mr Cummings, that I use the word scaremongering is because it's what the word that Vote Leave has used previously. Uh, and you said that you would be exposing the false claims and scaremongering of Bank of England Governor Mark Carney and his deputy, Sir John Cunliffe. So have you changed your mind? We will mind? certainly be exposing, scaremongering. We'll be, we'll be exposing all scaremongering as, as well as effectively as we can do in the next few weeks. So I'll ask again, was when uh, the Bank of England Governor said to this committee that Brexit was the biggest domestic risk to financial stability, do you think that was scaremongering? I do think it's scaremongering. Thank you very much. Um, the Monetary Policy Committee said that a vote to leave might result in an extended period of uncertainty about the economic outlook, including the prospects for export growth. But do you think the Monetary Policy Committee uh, are scaremongering as well? No, I think that the establishment has a general... Uh, uh, the, the establishment operates on the basis of herding around conventional wisdom. It's why the establishment has, has got every big foreign policy decision wrong since trying to deal with Bismarck in the 1870s, 1860s. All the big things Whitehall and Parliament have unfortunately got wrong since then. And they heard, it's what happens all the time, they heard it behind the ERM, they heard it behind the Euro, now they heard it behind supporting the EU. Uh, but uh, you know, conventional wisdom changes when crises hit, look what happened in 2008. All these people didn't predict that. An eclectic group of other people, often from outside the economics profession, outside politics, outside the establishment, they are the people who accurately said the financial system is going to fall off a cliff. It wasn't the people that you're quoting. Well, Mr Cummings, your uh, campaign is um, being championed by uh, the Mayor of London uh, um, and, uh, the, uh, and the Justice Secretary. If they're not part of the establishment, I'm not sure uh, uh, who is. Uh, so I don't think this is an issue about the establishment uh, versus uh, everyone else. It's very much about establishment thinking and conventional wisdom and herding. Well, would you not agree that the Mayor of London and the Justice Secretary are part of the establishment as much as the Governor and Deputy Governor of the Bank of England? No, I wouldn't. I think they are, I think they are champions of um, anti-establishment, anti-conventional wisdom thinking. Michael Gove has been like that for many a year. Um, like that product of Eton. Yes, I was going to say, did his anti-establishment uh, credential stop before or after he went to Eton College? Exactly. And, 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 might also be part of the establishment. Uh, um, the point is that this is not the establishment versus everybody else. Different members of the establishment, and you have mentioned uh, former Bank of England uh, Governor Mervyn King, uh, the former Chancellor Nigel Lawson. This is not the establishment versus everyone else. Different members of the establishment have taken different views on this referendum, and we'll find out what the country thinks on the 23rd of June. But my point, um, my question uh, remains, the MPC have made those remarks. Do you regard them as scaremongering or are they just wrong? I think they're, I, I, I think they're, I think they're wrong. I think that, uh, 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 as, as I've explained, that you know, when you have big institutional um, setups like the European Union, which have been around for many decades and the whole kind of global architecture is built on them, there is an inevitable great reluctance from the other elements of that bureaucracy to see it shaken up. When the ERM blew up, a lot of people said, stay in it, fight at all costs to stay in it, don't discredit the idea. You've seen the euro now is mangling the Greek economy in, 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 into a nightmare. And what is the view of the overall international bureaucracy? Try and prop the system up. Try not to, try not to face the fact that we, the guys in charge, have cocked it up. Well, the Greek that's, people, that's had, a, the Greek people had a, a, a referendum, I uh, believe, and they chose that they wanted to stay within yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the, the EU. Maybe they are part of the gun the held to their head. All that wrong, a very sad um, picture. As well. And, and I thought and you, as a Labour Party order, member, order, wouldn't have... Order, 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 Mr Campbell. Yeah. Await the question. 
Rachel Thank you very Reeves. much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I don't think you know anything about me or my politics, Mr. Cummings, so maybe you don't want to comment on those things. Um, coming back to some of the um, points that um, Chris um, Philp mentioned uh, in his uh, questions in the speech um, by the, um, Minister, the Secretary of State for Justice yesterday, um, he said in uh, his speech, I'll just quote from him if that's uh, okay, that um, it is sometimes claimed that we will only get free trade if we accept free movement, but the EU has free trade uh, deals with nations that obviously do not involve free movement. You do not need uh, free movement to have free trade and friendly cooperation. And of course that is uh, true, but let's not confuse free trade with the single market, going back to the point that uh, Chris Felt mentioned earlier. But isn't it the case that you may be able to get free trade outside the EU, but if you are outside the single market, you categorically will not get that same trade in services that we get today? Well, I think, it, as, I, as I explained before, I think there are many aspects of the single market which are which have been very damaging, not just for Britain, but for the entire continent. Um, I, I also uh, question your assumption that a single market in services is a good idea. I'll make two points about that. First point is people have been talking about this for a long time and it hasn't developed. The second thing is a single market in services would actually be deeply destructive for Great Britain. We attract the biggest proportion of investment into the European Union precisely because we have a different legal system to Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, etc. We have a common law system, we have a system of courts, contract, insurance, etc., etc., which is the reason why we suck in all this money from all around the world. The idea of harmonising our rules on all of this with Greece would be disastrous for these investment flows. So I, I reject your premise. The idea that we want a, a, quote, single market in services is false. Harmonisation of all of these rules is damaging often. Occasionally it's a good idea, but also when it is a good idea, it increasingly makes sense to make, the, to make those rules at a global level, not at a regional level. And there's a very good reason for that. When you make it at a global level, we can then have choice and flexibility about how we actually implement them. When we take it via the EU route, the ECJ is in charge of how we implement it and stops us ever getting out of it if it goes wrong. I'm not sure if this is really uh, answering uh, my question. In my the city uh, where I'm a member of parliament in Leeds, financial services is, is a very big part of our local uh, economy and, uh, and, and financial services are, are, um, are huge employers in the city, so a lot of jobs depend on mm -hmm. financial uh, services. At the moment, there's passporting arrangements uh, that uh, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you are abiding by the rules in your uh, home uh, country, you can uh, operate um, in other European countries uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because we're part of the single market. Yeah. Uh, if we were to leave the, um, to e the EU, uh, you may get a free trade agreement, so uh, no trade um, um, tariffs. Uh, but um, I, I, it's hard to see, given the comments of people like Wolfgang Schlabler, that you would have the same sort of trade in uh, services outside the European uh, Union. Would you agree with that? I mean, you may think it's a good thing, but would you agree with it? The single most important thing with the City of Financial Services is that we control the wide boys at Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan who drove the economy off a cliff in 2008. These banks often behave disgracefully, they pay, them, they pay themselves disgracefully, they, they, the most important thing is we control their behaviour in this country. Allowing the current system in which Goldman Sachs and all of these people spend millions in the corrupt Brussels lobbying system to rig the rules for themselves no, is Mr. a disaster and we should bring that to an end. Sorry, this may be an interesting point, but uh, it's not um, answering the question that I posed uh, to you. Goldman Sachs uh, do not have uh, uh, any branches or any employees in, in the city of Leeds. Um, what I was asking about was the passporting arrangements and whether we would have the same sort of uh, access uh, to uh, the services market across the European Union so, if we were um, outside. That's not about regulation, it's about those um, passporting passport arrangements. Passporting is part of regulation, exist. that's the whole point. The point is who makes all these regulations? Passporting is one aspect of it. My point is, the most important thing is that Britain controls the financial regulation for these companies. So you would be um, happy 
uh, that if we left the European Union, one of the consequences of that, or you would accept that one of the consequences of that, is that we wouldn't have that access uh, to the, the single market. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not accepting that. What, 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 I'm, what, what I'm saying is the, the, how the precise details of passporting are worked out is something that will have to be worked out. But, of course, there is a huge, there is a huge reason why that Europe will want to do that, and that is because Europe, Britain has the number one financial centre in Europe. They want to be here using our services. There is a great incentive for them to sort out the passporting system, well, the same as there is for us. But my main point is that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is we control the banks. We don't let the corrupt institutions of Brussels control the banks. Okay, I just want to clarify. I'm sorry to interrupt. Rachel, I just want to clarify, you did a moment ago say a single market in services would be deeply uh, disruptive for the UK, that uh, we don't want it. Is that correct? Correct. Single market equals harmonisation in Brussels, equals the rule of the ECJ, equals the rule of a legal system which is not the common law system, which equals the destruction of one of the most valuable assets this country's got. It's just important that we have clarification, and so therefore the premise on the basis of which policy under successive governments uh, has been pursuing is erroneous. That is, basically, single, since the Single European Act, an attempt has been made to construct a single market in services, which has had a measure, many would argue, of success, not whole, but partial. You're arguing that that whole enterprise was a, a, a catastrophic mistake by the UK. The whole enterprise has been misconceived from the beginning. Whitehall totally blundered at the very start of this entire so you're process. you're saying yes to what I'm Lord saying. Cofield, I'm saying definitely yes. Okay. Cofield that's, that's and DeLore okay. set the whole single market process away. They conned Thatcher over what it meant. Whitehall has never figured out what on earth is going on with this since. Okay. It babbles on about a single market and services. Rachel, and I just actually, it would be damaging. just wanted clarification of that point. Do, do carry on. Um, thank you, um, Chairman. So, um, not being part of the, the single market is, is not uh, um, something you would regard as a sacrifice. You think it is one of the reasons to leave the European Union is to leave the, the single market? I think that one of the great reasons to leave the European Union is that we end the jurisdiction of the ECJ and the Commission over all of these things. This whole regulatory regime which, of which the single market is the biggest aspect. I would remind you but the ECJ's and the Commission's definition of the single market includes the euro and the Schengen area. So being outside lots of parts well, of the single market is not controversial. I think we've already had this, discussion. Already had this uh, exactly. uh, discussion. So, so, uh, so the real question is, is... We're not part of the single currency. We're not part of Schengen. We're so, not so going we're already to be part outside of, the two um, biggest single market those, projects those already. Things. And but we'll we be adding have, to that. We do have, uh, Mr Cummings, as you know, uh, uh, access uh, to uh, that, 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 uh, that single market across the European Union for the sale of... of, of we are services. partially part of the single well, market. Let me now. just come back to um, one of your answers, and I'll, I'll wrap up in a moment, Mr. Chairman. Um, you said that um, other European countries would um, you know, want to do um, deals with us because they want to access, for example, uh, the financial services in London. Wouldn't it might maybe more likely um, that if we were left the European Union, uh, other countries might want to have some of those financial services uh, centred in their capital cities or in their financial centres rather than in London, Leeds and Edinburgh uh, where financial services is dominant today. Uh, and, uh, and, and instead of them wanting to do deals, for example, on financial services, they would want to take this as an opportunity to uh, take jobs from this country uh, uh, to, to their own countries. And there is a real risk that instead of the UK being the preeminent centre of financial services, Across the European Union, you may find that Paris or Frankfurt take jobs and business uh, from um, London, Leeds, Edinburgh, and other cities. Good luck trying to get Americans to leave Chelsea and move to Frankfurt. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We heard this, all of the same stuff over the euro. It never happened. Euro, London's position has strengthened since we stayed out of the euro. These scare stories, we've heard them all before. They don't mean anything. I, if you go and sit and talk, and, and talk to people at Goldman I've talked to people at Goldman Sachs and these other banks about this sort of thing, and what do they say? They say privately, of course we've got to be in favour of a single market in public. We have to negotiate with the European Commission every day. They've got us by the balls. Of course we've got to go along with this. 
But do you it's think I'm going to move? Evidence. Do you think I'm going to go and move to Frankfurt? Of course I'm not. Clear, the evidence that they have given both to this committee and in other fora, making clear that in their view uh, there are benefits to their organisation from membership net is false. It's two, two different things. Yeah, sorry, I just want to be clear. Is that correct? I'm giving you very straightforward, simple mm. questions. Is, is, it, is it false or not? It, it's, par it's partially correct, partially not. They do think that the current system they've got rigged with the European Commission is in their interests. And they are right in lots of ways because they spread their money around Brussels very liberally and they buy regulations that help them. But the idea that if we vote to leave... These Americans are going to leave Notting Hill and move to Frankfurt. Sorry. I think it's for the birds. I just want clarity on that point as well. What you are saying is that they are using uh, cash uh, to bribe their way in Brussels to obtain regulations that suit their firm's interests. Did on I get that? On a huge scale. Okay, so they're engaged in a, in a form of bribery to obtain the legislation that best suits them. Well, definitions of lobbying and bribery are always very difficult to draw clean lines between, aren't they? I see. And what you're saying is that that line is being blurred all the time by Goldman Sachs at best, and perhaps they are the wrong side of it. Is that what I'm What I'm saying is everyone knows that Brussels is a deeply corrupt city. Everyone knows that the European Union is a deeply corrupt institution. It can't... Its accounts are... Con even if, it can't even cheat its own internal auditors well enough to hide the fact that its own accounts are dodgy. And every year it has to admit that. So I think, don't think that's a controversial position. I think we are finally, we're not quite in a way, perhaps all of us expected getting somewhere this afternoon um, with this evidence from Vote Leave, who, who are, after all, the official campaign uh, for um, those who feel that we should leave uh, the EU. Um, Helen Goodwin. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Mr. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, in the covering letter for Vote Leave's application to the Electoral Commission to be the lead campaign group, mm. uh, you said, we are committed to campaigning in a way that will create a legacy for the country's democratic processes and traditions. I wonder if you could explain how this squares with the plans which you expressed to the Telegraph uh, in November 2015 that you would target the annual meetings of companies that support <coughs> remaining in the EU? Well, there are... The, it, it, so it depends what, what it is you're talking about. There has been uh, a, an exercise by the CBI, uh, a dreadful organisation which has consistently misrepresented business opinion to, uh, to, to, to try and use its weight with the BBC and to persuade people that most businesses are in favour of the EU and in favour of further integration. As you will have seen, um, the British Polling Council described their uh, last attempt at doing this as, quote, dodgy, unquote. Um, there are also all sorts of complicated re uh, aspects You'll of how aware various that businesses... You'll be aware that we don't use in Parliament. I know it's a word you don't use in Parliament. I'm saying I'm directly quoting what the British Polling Council described the CBI's methodology as, quote, dodgy, unquote. So that's not my term, that's the British Polling Council's description of how the CBI conducts itself. Um, these things need to, be, uh, need to be exposed. I witnessed exactly the same process on the Euro campaign in 1999 when they lied repeatedly about their membership then. They, they lied about how many members they had, they lied about how they were surveying them. They, they, they persistently lied about business opinion and they've been doing the same thing on the EU. So you're telling us that the CBI is lying about the views of their members when they are presenting the uh, benefits of EU membership, which is felt by many large organisations. The CBI is so dishonest, it won't even tell you how many members it's got. That's the scale of its dishonesty. If you bring the CBI in here and say, how many members have you got, they won't tell you. OK, Mr Cummings. They hide Let's all of these numbers precisely in order that they Mr. can cheat Cummings, their surveys. Mr Cummings, we won't get through my questions if you give such long, extended uh, descriptions of your view of the world. Sorry. Does, um, I don't quite see how you square that with the fact that uh, over a third of FTSE companies wrote a letter saying that they support continued membership of the 
of the EU. So when you say FT, FT, do you mean FTSE companies? Yes. Over a third of FTSE companies mm. have written a letter, a public letter, yeah. saying that they support EU membership. Now, yeah. lots of those companies will be in the CBR. Mm -hmm. So the CBI wouldn't seem to be misrepresenting the views of their members if, quite separately, we see that a third of FTSE 100 companies are saying that it is in their interest to be in the EU. Well, rem remember the CBI also laughably claims to be the voice of British business, not just the voice of the 100 biggest companies in the country. So it, it ought to be representing the views of non-FTSE companies as well. Of course, in fact, they're lying about that and they don't do that, but it doesn't tally with what, with, with, with what you're saying. Do the, you have the support the, of any FTSE 100 companies, Mr Cummings? Simon Wolfson recently came out and said that he thinks that the EU is a, is a bad idea. As an individual, are, but do you have any, any companies saying that they think it's a good idea? Generally speaking, the, uh, the people who are on our side tend to operate on a, on a personal basis for, for exactly the same reasons as I was just talking about regarding Goldman Sachs. So you don't the, have any FTSE 100 companies where the boards have agreed that they wish to make a public commitment to remaining in Europe? To, to leaving Europe. The board, no, the board stay out of it, the same way as they did on the Euro campaign. What happened after we went on the Euro? Then suddenly all these companies say, yeah, we agree, the Euro is a rubbish idea. So you think this is just a piece of games play? I know it is. I know it is, because I meet these people all the time. Well, you're not, you don't have a monopoly on meetings with people from industry. Um, how many jobs do you think in this country relate to exports to the EU, depend on exports to the EU at the moment? I think that, um, that, that there, is, there is no good number for that because, because words like depend are so, uh, are so they're meaningless. You think, you think it's meaningless to say that uh, a, a percentage of the company's turnover which uh, comes from exports to Europe means that a proportion of the jobs depend on um, exports to the EU. Is like, that what you're saying? I didn't quite follow what you're saying, but, 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 but I'll, I'll say what, 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 what I think. You, for uh, I was on the Euro campaign 15 years ago when the famous... Sorry, I'm not interested in the Euro campaign 15 years ago. Yes. I'm asking you, do, how, do you know how many jobs depend on exporting to the EU in the British economy? It's a very simple question. And I'm saying to you that the word depend renders the sentence meaningless. We've had this, we've had, this argument has been going since March 1999 when the big study was published about the so-called three million jobs depending on the EU. Now, oh, that so was, you do know the number. So you do know that three million jobs in this country depend on exporting to the EU. I spoke to the guy who did that report the day the report was published in 1999 and do you know what he said? He said that the use of this campaign, of this report, by Britain in Europe is, quote, worse than Goebbels, unquote. That's what he said that morning, and that's why so that... So you're saying that the suggestion in the document published by the government, by, which was written by Treasury officials, estimating that the number of jobs relating to exports to the EU, which they put at 3 million, is worse than Goebbels. Is that what I'm you're saying, telling the I'm saying that. I'm saying that... The people who wrote the original research have described its use by the likes of Nick Clegg and the pro-EU campaigners as worse than Goebbels, correct. That's not my words, that's the words of, uh, of the people who actually wrote the, who actually wrote the report, because, because it's conf it conflates the weasel word depend with, oh, they will be lost if we vote to leave, Sorry, Mr. which is a non-secondary. Mr. Cummings, Mr. Cummings, I haven't asked you about how many jobs would be lost, were we to leave the EU. Uh, that's, that wasn't my question. I was asking you about how many depend. I agree with you. There is a distinction to be made about the current state of the British economy and what would happen were we to leave. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to concentrate now for a minute, not on what happened 15 years ago, but on the number of jobs in this country which depend on exporting to the EU. And the figure mm -hmm. based on the ONS, and you say that you always use the official statistics as well, is 3 million. Do you know what proportion of that are manufacturing jobs? I think, you, I think you're misunderstanding these numbers. The government's own figures show, the government's own figures show that only 5% of British businesses export to the EU. 5%. 95% don't. 
And that is because we have a spread of sizes of company, and therefore you have, I agree with you, 5% of companies, but they are very large companies which employ a lot of people, and therefore you have a lot of jobs which depend on exporting to the EU market. Mm -hmm. So to say that only 5% of companies export to the EU and to say that 3 million jobs are dependent on the EU is completely compatible. Do you understand that, Mr Cummings? I don't really understand what you're saying, no, I'm afraid. Mr Cummings, do you understand that it, not every company in this country is the same size? I do understand that, yes. Good. So you think that at the moment only 5% of companies export to the EU. Not that I think, that's what the government's figures are. Okay. Do you accept that of those companies, a significant proportion are very large? Probably, yes. Good. Fine. Now, of the 3 million jobs which are dependent on the EU export... How do you define dependent? I define dependent as working out the proportion of turnover. But if I might say so... So I don't understand what that means. What do you mean Mr. percentage Cummings, of turnover? Mr Cummings, in a select committee, the convention is that the members ask the questions mm -hmm. and the witness provides the answers. And you seem to have some difficulty with that, if I might say so. And yet, you've told us that the key plank of the Leave campaign is to restore the sovereignty of Parliament. I would have thought that if you were really interested in promoting the sovereignty of Parliament and, as you put it, being committed to campaigning in a way that will create a legacy for the country's democratic processes and, and traditions, you might pay slightly more attention to answering the questions you're asked rather than punting off on the latest thing that happens to have popped into your head. Mr Cummings, you said a minute ago that you thought that the Drugs Trials Directive was not... Uh, that came out of Europe was not very useful? That's not a question. Do you want me to answer? Uh, am I understanding correctly? What, what, what was it you were saying about the well, drugs? I'm not a specialist. There are lots of these things. It's not, the point is not what I personally think. I'm saying what other people think. The point about the cl Clinical Trials Directive is that Nobel scientists stood up and said, this is madness. The, this thing is slowing down the trials of cancer drugs. It's making them more expensive. It's literally killing people. And there's nothing we can do about it. So it's not you, what my opinion is, I'm, I'm just okay. quoting what they said. Okay. Are you aware that Andrew Whitty, who's the chief executive of GlaxoSmithKline, a large drugs company located with several factories in this country, has said, Europe has gone from 27 fragmented, independent, not talking to each other regulatory authorities in the healthcare space to one. That's a big deal. Have you heard that he's said that? I have not. What do you think the implications of that statement from the head of GlaxoSmithKline is? What's the impact of it? The implication. Well, as I said before, a lot of big, uh, a lot of big multinational companies like the Brussels system. Um, uh, for since Adam Smith wrote, it's been a, a, an obvious. A agreed idea that big businesses use regulation to crush entrepreneurs and competition and small businesses. A lot of big businesses love the EU system precisely because it allows them to lobby and crush their competition. What he says has nothing to do with, it doesn't change I will take the opinion of Nobel Prize winning biologists over the opinion of the CEO of a head of big of, of a big pharmaceutical company on the wisdom or otherwise of the clinical trials directive. Mr... Cummings, do you think it is realistic to suggest that you can have small companies entering the pharmaceuticals industry? Isn't it inherent in pharmaceuticals, given the need to have experiments and safe drugs, that these are companies that must operate at scale? Totally wrong. I think you don't understand what's going on in those industries. If you look at what's happening now in pharmaceuticals, for example... There's a whole revolution in computational biology and synthetic biology, uh, which is integrating pharmaceutical companies with Silicon Valley and the whole revolution in, in computer science. So I think the premise of your question is completely false. Mr Cummings, do you not understand that the reason 
that Glaxo think it's a good idea to have one regulatory standard across the EU is that that means that they can, at an economic price, produce drugs for the whole EU, whereas if and when there were 27 <laughs> different sets of standards, it's uneconomic to produce the drugs to the quality which people need for the benefit of their health care. I think that's complete rubbish, I'm afraid. I don't, think that, I don't think the argument holds water. What I think is true is that there are various ways in which very, very big multinational institutions have an interest in trying to preserve the power of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And in various ways, they think it makes some aspects of their business convenient. But the decision in this referendum is not about propping up the interests of established multinational corporations. We should be thinking much, much, much wider than that. We should be thinking about the entire system, the entire ecosystem of businesses and research and development. So not, you're not interested not in the views of any large companies in this country? Of course one's interested in the views, but you can't be... But, 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 you, but you have to understand how these companies operate. If you're British Airways... OK, let me give you another example. Do you want me to answer the question or not? I think you're about to punt off again, and I, I need to ask you another question. Hitachi, which is a large multinational company, has said that it invested in the UK in order to access the whole of the EU market. And unimpeded access to the EU market is fundamental for our position in the UK. Do you not see that leaving Europe puts at risk inward investment from companies like Hitachi? Heard all the same stuff on the euro. Don't buy it. Mr Cummings, do you not understand that the issues at stake with belonging to the EU are quite different from those at stake for whether or not to join the euro? The euro issue was confined solely to the question of what the exchange rate mechanisms would be. Belonging to the EU is, as Mr Phillips set out very well in his questioning to you earlier, mm -hmm. about the benefits to the British economy of joining the single market. Do you understand the distinction, therefore, between belonging to the EU and belonging to the euro? I do understand that. I'm not sure if you understand the distinctions Sorry, about what the definition of the, of the single before, market are. As I've explained to you, the questions are asked by the parliamentarians so what's your and the witness. So what's your question, my question was whether you understood the difference between the EU and the Euro. That I was do understand point. that distinction, yeah. Good. Now, I want to go on to ask you uh, how the Leave campaign is being financed. Who are the big financiers of the Leave campaign? We'll publish that in accordance with the rules, I think, in two weeks' time or something. That, if I might say so, was rather an evasive uh, answer. Do you not know now? How, how, is, that, how is that evasive? I'm saying... The, you, do, you don't know are, who your, your funders are? There are rules about how we have to publish all of this information. There certainly uh, are. But that yeah, does not mean just been, that when you are in front of a parliamentary been, committee, just, just that does not mean that when you're in front of a parliamentary committee, you do not need to answer the questions. And I'm asking you, can you tell us who is funding the Leave campaign? You're telling me that I'm under a legal obligation to tell you who I'm financed by. The convention is, as you know, and you're the person who says that parliamentary sovereignty is <laughs> your main priority. <laughs> so the convention is, <laughs> you answer the questions. There are quite a few modifications in my are. personal model for the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly don't know what that means. I'm going to ask you about... Um, a report in the Daily Telegraph about the funding of the Leave campaign. Mm -hmm. Are you expecting to receive money from Peter Crudders, a city financier? We'll publish all this data in, I think, 10 days or so, and in, in a completely legal way. We might have to move. I've, the, the Electoral Commission has sent us stuff, I think, today about how we have to publish this. I haven't read all the details of it. Um, I don't want to accidentally say something contrary to what I've been told by the Federal Commission. No, are you not, I'm not asking we'll, you. We'll sorry, all there of is that. no possibility of your. There is no possibility of your cutting across the Electoral Commission by asking my questions. I am asking you whether you are being financed by Peter Credis, a city financier, by Stuart Wheeler, 
a spread betting pioneer and former UKIP treasurer, by Crispin Odi, a hedge fund operator, and by John Cordwell, an entrepreneur and philanthropist. I think Peter Corliss has already said in the public domain his answer to that question. Um, all, all funding information we put in the public domain in a proper legal way, as we are obliged to. Um, I'm, uh, I can't, I'm not sure what more I can say than that. We're not hiding anything. It's all going to be public. Well, you are hiding because you're not answering the question. question. Mr Cummings, the, point, the reason I'm asking you about the funding is not pure curiosity, but your answers to my questions about pharmaceuticals and manufacturing were, if I might say so, rather thin. And I'm concerned that the Vote Leave campaign seems to be dominated by a small number of people from the financial sector who don't seem to know very much about the British economy and British manufacturing, on which millions of people in this country depend. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Okay, I think, I think it's we'll have totally to make that last question then move on. Sure thing. I think it's I think it, 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 it's it, it's factually wrong, uh, and it's factually wrong on two levels. One is that the donors have no influence on what the policy is. We we it's not how the, how the campaign works. It would be stupid uh, if we were to operate any other way. Secondly, the um, the funding for the organisation comes through um, a huge number over I don't know how many thousands, but a few thousand small, medium-sized businesses out around the country who are in manufacturing. John Elliott in the North East, for example, has got a factory there employing a few hundred people. It's people like that who are the backbone of the economy, anyway, who are supporting our campaign and who are funding our campaign. And all of these details will be put, as is, as is proper, in the public domain anyway, in a 35 10 days' time. You that you are going to publish this fully and in accordance with electoral law uh, by the due date, and that will be available for us to scrutinise. Exactly so. And uh, at that time, if we have further questions about the funding, we will want to see you again. We'll see what that what that material sure is. Sure thing. Jacob Rieson. Um, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cummings, for coming in very much. I have personally made a modest donation to Vote Leave that won't, I'm sorry to say, be declarable. Um, I rather wish it were, because <laughs> I have all sorts of good people, and anybody watching this will give you lots of money. Thank uh, you. And I'm also one of your hoplites, so very pleased to support. Uh, Vote Leave is a great organisation doing patriotic work, as you've been doing nobly for the last uh, hour and three quarters. Um, but what I want to move on to is um, how we would get out if the happy news on the 24th of June is that the British people are voting mm -hmm. to leave. Um, before you were running the campaign, you gave various thoughts as to how this might happen and the complexities. The Prime Minister is saying that he will exercise Article 50 on the, Saturday, on the Friday morning. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's realistic? I think the idea that the Prime Minister would um, go over to Brussels and start Article 50 on, on, the, on the Friday morning, uh, I think is, a, is literally a crazy idea. I don't think there is the faintest chance of that happening. Uh, I don't think there's a faintest chance, act, to be honest, of the Prime Minister actually even trying to do that. Uh, if he were to try to do that, he would, uh, I think, be stopped by this House. Um, John Cunliffe. Uh, Akra was formerly Akra, and not necessarily somebody who you and I would often agree with, uh, in front of this committee said that a wise government would spend a little bit of time working out what it wanted, uh, would have preliminary discussions with other member states, yeah. and would then exercise Article 50 at that point. Is, do you broadly agree with Sir John Cunliffe? I, 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 I do broadly. I think that, I think almost inevitably, the, the kind of overall phases will be. We win on the 23rd, people take a deep breath. We have to create a new government team to go and do the negotiations. We couldn't send off the likes of Philip Hammond and whatnot, who've just failed so spectacularly again. So the Prime Minister will have to assemble a new team of people. There'll then be uh, informal negotiations with the, uh, on an intergovernmental level and with the European Union institutions. I think then once you've got the overall picture of what you want to do, you would then say, right, how do we solve the legalities? And only after that do you then get into, right, here's how we use Article 50, if we use Article 50 at all, here's what the timescale would be, here's the timescale for when we'll repeal the 1972 European Communities Act, probably incorporate all existing European Union law into domestic law, and then begin the process of sorting it out. I think, roughly speaking, that kind of framework 
most people would agree is a sensible way forward. And what sort of time frame do you think that would happen in? I'm not at all an expert on any of this sort of thing, uh, um, and, and, and reluctant to give any sort of any sort of guess. I think that <coughs> overall, I think I think one important point is just it's the way we think of this th this thing. It's often described in the media and in the campaign as if it's an event, but really it's a process. We're talking about a new relationship, and there's not going to be a discrete interval at which, after we win, we say, "All oh, right, here is 100% of everything solved, done." and then we continue in some static way. It's going to be a gradual thing, and I think, hopefully, you'll be able to break the back of all the, you know, you'd have a 90% solution to a lot of these things very quickly. A lot of them have been solved already around the world in different trade agreements, for example. Um, so I think you'd probably try and break the back of the problem pretty quickly, and then figure out, right, how do you then sort out the really tricky remaining things over time? And you did, at an earlier stage, discuss the possibility of a second referendum on which the European Union has form, that people who don't vote the way the Panjandrums like get ordered to vote again and to keep on voting until they do as they're told. Yeah. Do you think there is a prospect that the EU may come back with the sort of deal um, that the government ought to have aimed for in terms of its, its renegotiation, and that that might lead to a second referendum before the Article 50 process has been completed? <coughs> It's a very, very tricky question. Um, I stress a couple of things. One, when I wrote that thing about second referendum, it was before vote leave even existed, before the name even existed or anything. So it's not in any sense official vote leave policy. Um, I think that we've all seen how the EU operates, and they they have historically not taken a no for an answer, and they have always tried to go back and tell people you've got to vote again until you come up with the right answer. So th there's no doubt in my mind that the Commission and uh, elements of the Foreign Office um, will collude in trying to say, how do we, how do we get out of this? Um, so I think that will definitely happen. Um, a lot of it will depend on the political realities, what happens to the Prime Minister, what happens inside the Conservative Party. Um, I, my own personal bet would be that the EU will not come back with an offer that's along the lines of, please don't leave, we're going to change the whole system completely, you were right all along, let's have different kinds of membership, stay and have this kind of membership instead, we'll rewrite the whole thing. Of course, it's theoretically a possibility that we might do that, and in lots of ways, it would have been ideal if that whole process had happened before, and this whole system had changed without the need for, 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 for this referendum happening in the way that it has and the timing it has. It would be better to solve this problem in a different way. But I suspect now that they are so terrified of the Euro project completely falling apart on them that they will calculate better to have Britain out and do a deal with Britain as an external entity rather than, um, than, than, than potentially start the dominoes toppling. You know, as you know, the history of this project is that, that Monet and Delors have stuck to a very strong principle, and that is integration is one way only. And, you know, we saw last year how strongly these guys think about it, even when, with the nightmare of Greece falling apart, mass unemployment at a level you haven't seen since Hitler in the 1930s, they still had that iron in their soul to say, keep the project going, no backing down. And I suspect that they'll probably do the same thing again. So, the one other possibility, as you will remember before the Scottish referendum, uh, the government in great panic offered Devomax basically to provide almost everything that was being asked for by the SNP. The caravan may disagree. Um, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a panic just before the vote, do you think there's any chance of what one might call your own men being proposed very shortly before the vote to say, we're panicking, we look as if we're going to lose, and therefore actually the UK to keep the project going, to keep them in, to win this vote and basically have what it wants. I think there's a, there's a pretty good chance of that. And I've spoken to people in government, in Whitehall, in the Cabinet Office, who have actively been thinking about some of these schemes. One of the most obvious schemes, if, the, if Cameron and Osborne are desperate, is for them to announce that um, some kind of, we will amend the 1972 European Communities Act to ensure that it will not do blah, blah, blah in the future. If they were thinking about some kind of um, a, a scam like that, uh, in the hope that it would persuade Boris to support them. Um, of course, that didn't work. Boris stuck to his principles, supported vote leave. Um, but they're clearly thinking about 
something like that, and it would not surprise me at all to see Cameron Osborne on a stage offering something like that, possibly with uh, representatives from the European Union saying, oh yes, we'll do this new deal, don't worry. Um, but one would want that pretty firmly nailed down before trusting them to deliver on it, because their record on delivering is not very good. My, my approach to it would be to, 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 to say, um, OK, you guys are offering us this great new deal, are you? Very conveniently, a couple of weeks before the refer referendum. OK, well, we can vote yes and find out whether you're telling the truth. But then, if we get stiffed, we're up the creek without a paddle. By far the safest thing, if they really are desperate and they're offering some new deal, vote no and we'll figure it, we'll find out next week if there really is a deal on the table. So in all circumstances, the safest option is vote to leave. Excellent. Thank you very much for your evidence this afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, It's coming good afternoon. Um, on your website, um, the vote leave says that after leaving the EU, um, quote, we would spend our money on our priorities. We would take back control of our migration policy, and we would end the supremacy of e EU law. Um, do, you, do you therefore envisage that uh, on leaving the, e the EU, the UK will no longer sign up to free movement, that it will again, that it will regain control over regulation in all areas that the EU presently exercises its competence, and that it will no longer pay into the EU budget in any way, shape, or form? Um, free movement, regulation, and EU budget were your three things. Yes, right? yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Roughly speaking, yes, but with, a, with, but with a couple of kinks. Um, in terms of the regulation, as we were discussing earlier on, increasingly the regulation which comes from the EU is actually coming from global bodies. So there are some things which, are, which we have currently implemented as EU rules, which are actually things that are coming down from, from, at a global level. So even after we leave the EU, we would not necessarily uh, get rid of them. We would implement them differently, perhaps, but would, there would not necessarily be... Or, sorry rephrase it, that's a stupid way of putting it. There definitely will not be a complete abolition of all of these things. A lot of these things will stay in one form or another, obviously, and there will be various things set at the global level which we will, which we will keep, though not under the jurisdiction of the ECJ. In terms of the budget, um, my personal view is that there are many ways in which, um, in which we should be deepening cooperation across Europe. My argument with the European Union is not that it's about international cooperation, it's that it's so rubbish at it and that in lots of ways it, it, it is undermining international cooperation and undermining friendly relations between countries and exacerbating political extremism, particularly in, in, in Southern Europe. And I would hope that after we vote leave we'll find new ways of cooperating in a deeper way, in a closer way, but not under the jurisdiction of the ECJ. Now lots of those kinds of things will involve um, countries coming together to cough up their fair, their fair bid in the kitty for Project X or Project Y. And this is a sort of social support, that type of thing, so um, uh, st st structure fund type of thing? I don't. Th uh, my personal view is that that's not the sort of thing which would be, which is the best example. I mean, structural fund, we, we, funds we, 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 are... What would be a good example? Uh, uh, um, science collaborations are the most obvious example. Uh, you know, the, 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 it's an interesting example, the science one. The Horizons programme, of course, is often, uh, the in campaign often acts as if, oh, we'll be outside all of these things after we sort of leave. But of course, the, the Horizons programme already has in countries like Israel that are completely outside the European Union. So I think that after we vote leave, one of my great hopes is that central to national strategy after we vote leave is making science and research in fundamental science a much higher priority, fundamental physics and, and computer science in particular. And therefore, I think we would cooperate much more on those sort of things and therefore pay into a common kitty in lots of these different areas. What I'm really looking at, though, is, is our ability to be able to trade with Europe. And uh, you, you would, of course, accept that if we are going to trade with Europe, uh, we have to meet all the, 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 the rules regarding safety of cars, for example, or safety of food. We can't possibly trade with them in any other way. Yes. Um, so we would have to then, obviously, apply by those rules, even yes. though we had no, no, no part to... Uh, to doing it. Yes. I think you've already said you don't want to be part of a single market, so there would never be any question that we would have some sort of hybrid Norwegian model. Is that what you're saying? So I said that we're already not part of two well, fundamental aspects of the single market. But, 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 but we, are, we, we, we have act. Look, I, I know, and, and I think we're dancing on the head of the pin with that particular point, because in, to all intents and purposes, we, we, we trade as a member of the single market, irrespective of whether we have it in the past. Um, but I think o overall, the answer to the question is yes, I yeah. think the single market in many ways is deeply damaging. 
I think that we will be far better off if we set rules for ourselves outside mm -hmm. jurisdiction of, of the ECJ. Um, that will mean that uh, that um, the companies that want to export into the European Union will have to abide by those rules the same way the companies in California have to. Mm -hmm. But we will also then uh, our services sector, which is of course much much bigger for the in, 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 overall in our economy, and most of which goes outside the European Union, not inside the European Union. All of that will be free of single market regulation. And in fact, it makes no sense whatsoever to impose the nightmare Brussels system on all sorts of service businesses where most of our business is either domestic or, or outside the EU, and only a small fraction of it actually goes to the EU. But there's one important point when it comes to services. I mean, there's, uh, we talk a great deal about the, the, the relative um, uh, trade balances that we have with Europe, and we, we are currently running in 2014 a 78.9 billion pound trade deficit with Europe. Mm. Actually, if you were to take out services, that trade deficit would be even greater. Mm. Um, and, and this is the point. I, mean, we, I, I think we get to the point where we agree we're not going to try to stay in one form or another within the single market, however you define it. Um, so we're going to be looking for some sort of trade deal with Europe. Um, you know, if I put myself in the position of being the German uh, trade minister or the French trade minister or Italian trade minister, then, then it would be in my interest as a, as a European that we would have a, uh, a trade deal on goods, but not on services, because, of course, clearly we'd be selling more goods. We wouldn't be running a... You know, we, we, we'd be skewing the numbers in our favour. What's to stop that happening? I don't well, And you've also said you're not that keen on the services side. So, actually, our economic position would be worse off in Europe um, by what you've discussed earlier. I think the, 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 the overall situation would be a great game, because... So, so you, you, we're agreeing that we'd have... a Free trade deal on goods, done. With no chance. in terms of exactly in terms of in terms of services, most of service business is domestic, so we would then be freeing all of that business from the single market regulatory system, and the service business which is not domestic is but over sixty percent outside the European Union. Into Europe? How are, we, how are you preparing to sell services into Europe? Well, these these things are all a balance, aren't they? So you have to look at. What, uh, what the relative advantages are. Given that the overwhelming majority of our service business is either domestic or outside the European Union, what is the advantage for us in having all of that business regulated by Brussels and the ECJ? Well, it's, a mass, it's a huge, huge net loss for us. Instead of a £9 billion pound, uh, trade deficit, we'd have a £105 billion pound trade deficit. But look at all the gains we make elsewhere in the world. Only 13% of the British economy is engaged with trade with the EU. In services, eighty-seven percent of it isn't. And if you look at services rather than goods, the figures are, ir are even bigger balance because so much of our business goes elsewhere and has done for two hundred years. But if you were to go to the Chinese government and ask them why they have offshore uh, Renminbi B trading base in London, they don't say they come here because because London is a nice place with a nice law. That part of it, but they come well, because they say a nice place. Or what sort of with, with nice law and nice culture and they speak English. The reason, the reason we have offshore Roman B trading in London is because we provide the best access point to Europe in terms of accessing the single market, which is what they want to see. They want to have access to, to, to 50, 550 million people trading in Roman B if they want to. With, with, with respect, I don't, think, I don't think that's correct. I think that the, 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 the big advantages which London has as a financial centre predate our membership to the European Union. They're based on a very complex network of skills, language, time zone, culture, all of the other aspects of London uh, which Frankfurt uh, and other countries don't have. It's very striking that the second biggest financial centre in Europe is outside the European Union. It's in Switzerland. It is not inside the European Union. So with respect, I think that the reason why China, America, all this investment comes to, comes to London is very, very much based on the idea that overall London is the best place to do business. And a big part of that is common law system, the court system, they know that their contracts will be respected. That's why they want to trade here, and that's why harmonising our rules with Greece will be a disaster for those kinds of services. Why yeah, do we want shipping, Greece insurance? Greece rules with us would be very successful for Greece. That would help stabilise their financial system. I mean, you know, we take the lead on this, and this is one area in Europe where we can, where we can demonstrate that we have brought about banking reform, financial services reform, we're ahead of the curve on this. We've, 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 we've adopted our own policies when it comes to ring fencing of banks. The Lickin and proposals have, have been on, on, on this, well, in fact, the Banking Commission. We've studied all of this, and uh, 
and as a result of which we came up with a Vickers proposal. This seems to be taking the lead in where we're moving forward on this. You know, we are seen by the world as one of the best countries, or if not the best country, to have financial services regulation. Europe comes up with odd things which are incredibly irritating, and no doubt about it. Many of us here will get very frustrated about um, you know, potential uh, financial transaction tax, bonus caps, this kind of stuff, which are not right for one reason or another. But nonetheless, we can, you know, the overall direction of travel is one of, uh, is one of the, the positive movement. But I just want to sort of slightly move on from this. The, um, you know, we've accepted that, that, that New Danes wouldn't necessarily agree we'd want to be, continue to be part of a single market, that we would have to organise uh, an, an arrangement, um, and in the, a, a, a trading arrangement. And in the Guardian this morning, um, your report is saying, this is as a result of Michael Gove's speech yesterday, that you've spoken to umpteen ambassadors inside and outside the Eurozone who said they would be willing to, to do a comprehensive trade deal with the UK. Uh, would you like to share, share uh, with us uh, which ambassadors those were and indeed how many there were? No, I wouldn't. Are there any? Umpteen. Umpteen. So somewhere between 13 and 19. Is kind of what I've always understood. The reasonable definition of umpteen. But you're not going to share with us who they are. No. Why not? Surely you, I mean, this is a fantastic piece of news. If you're able to come with the vote leave and be able to say that, that there, are, there are ambassadors of countries that we want to do business with, why wouldn't you want to share that? What do you think would happen if I said, oh, yes, I had lunch with the ambassador to X yesterday and he said blah about this? Do you think everyone would go, oh, God? Cummings is right after all. Oh, that argument's collapsed. Well, well if you come back to us, the ambassador would lovely. say, the ambassador would say, it's completely invented it, I've never said any such thing. What does this crazy person say? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I disagree with you very strongly. At the end of the day, it is, it is, um, an ambassador is not about, a, you know, an ambassador will sit down with you and have a perfectly, you know, I have lunch with ambassadors from time to time. And, and none of the conversations we have are absolutely completely private. You could at least tell us who you've, sp who you've had lunch with in terms of the ambassadors, even if you can't tell us what the conversations were. At least it gives us a bit of a, um, a, bit of a clue as to, as, to, as to, you know, are you talking to Malta or are you talking to Germany? You know, it's important that we know which ones they are. Well, everyone's free to go and talk to all of these people, but with respect, I'll but keep, I'll keep private do. conversations. I'll the thing is, we do talk to private. many of these people. They we do. Say what you and they don't say what you do, including, I might add, some of these international investment banks. I've spent a great deal of time talk, having private, and private conversations with these investment banks. And actually, what you've said actually goes completely against what they're saying to me in private. And this is over the period of the last two or three years where I've been speaking to them as a member of the Fresh Start Project, which, as you know, the substantive part of which has now gone into the Moses the Vote Leave campaign, leaving one or two of us behind as, as, as um, enthusiastic. As, as, as an isolated minority of, of, like of, of, the of, about, market. of about 500 members of Parliament, and, and on it goes anyway, so we're getting slightly distracted. But the point is, it, it is important that by, by, by not answering some of these questions, it, and I don't mean to be rude, but it comes over as you look sort of slightly shifty, not, not, not having the answers. And we're giving an opportunity to come up with a very strong um, you know, argument as to, as to, as to why we should maybe, maybe, maybe I can move on with something else. Um, Michael Gove raised the European Free Trade Zone yesterday. This is not something I've heard of, and I'm not sure many of my colleagues on this committee have ever heard of it before. Could you, could you talk about, you, know, you talk about it on your website, there's a European Free Trade Zone from Iceland to the Russian border, and we will be part of it. What is this European Free Trade Zone? Well, from, from Iceland to Russia, the Russian border, there uh, is a network of different relationships in which uh, all European countries, in or out of the EU, in or, in, in or out of the Europe, uh, enjoy uh, free trade in, in goods. A lot of the arrangements are, uh, are slightly different, obviously, but generally speaking, there is free trade in goods over that entire area. And uh, the big exception is Belarus. And uh, the idea that Britain is going to be alongside Belarus as the only two countries without free trade in goods uh, in, Western, in Western Eurasia is not, um, uh, is not a sensible prediction, I don't think. No, sure. But, but obviously, we've talked about services. So Switzerland is the second biggest financial services centre that you've talked about in the world. doesn't have a group of financial services. Um, the Ukraine... Um, which has just negotiated a free trade agreement that retains tariffs and services sectors. It doesn't cover cross-border provision of most services, including financial services. Again, um, Turkey, which part of which part of the EU customs union 
um, and is therefore unable to pursue an independent uh, trade policy. Is Turkey part of this free trade zone? Uh, no, I mean, for, yeah. so Turkey, as you say, is inside. Is, 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 Kosovo doesn't have a preferential agreement with the EU. Um, I think Kosovo does have some sort of deal with the EU, actually. Um, I think you might be wrong about that. Okay, we can, we can always check that. But we can check that. I think, I think the overall point is that there is free trade in goods from but, Iceland to Russia. But, but, but Belarus is the only, only example, is the only counter example, yeah. and we're not going to be with Belarus. There'll be a deal because it's in everyone's interest for there to be a deal. When, when you talk about this free European free trade zone, as I say, this is a concept which has kind of really made its debut yesterday, I think, in Michael Gove's speech. But, but, but what is it? I mean, at the end of the day, what you're talking about is actually a, a number of countries have come up with their own individual arrangements. This is not a club that we can become a member of. It's, it's, it's we come up with our own arrangements and we just become another country within this sort of notional group of countries about bordering the edge of Europe that has a notional trade arrangement. Uh, surrounding goods, is that right? Roughly, uh, uh, what's the overall what's the overall architecture that we need? We need an overall architecture in which all countries in Europe, in or out of the EU or in or out of the Euro, can trade freely and cooperate in a friendly way, in all sorts of ways, deeper than we do now. That's the system which Europe needs to cr needs to create. The current system is manifestly broken. Over the next 20, 30 years, a new system is going to come into place one way or the other. We can do it the hard way or we can do it the easy way. Our argument is that after we vote leave, it will force this discussion onto the agenda for Europe. They won't be able to treat us like Ireland or some other little country that can just say, get lost and go, go and do it again. It will force the creation of a much, much friendlier, happier European system. We will be. We, we, we will end the Delors Monet picture, in which there is only one way forward, and that is that the European Commission and the European Court of Justice get more and more power and money every year. That will end, and that will be a good thing, not just for Britain, but for all of our European friends. But do you envisage a, a, a non-European, but Euro, non-EU, but European continent free trade zone? Certainly, I think it will be so a great. You, thing. So you would see this as a club developing this. That's outside I think, I think, the, uh, EU, the, right? the, the failure of the Euro project means that the institutional architecture for Europe is, is going to have to change. It's already changing. Brussels has its agenda for how it should change, which is the Five Presidents Report, which is doubling down on the same failed Monet method. More centralisation. The answer to everything is more and more power for Brussels and the ECJ. That's one answer to the problem, but it's not sustainable in the long run. It's not sustainable economically. It's not sustainable democratically. People are not going to people are not going to, 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 to go with it over the next twenty years. So by hook or by crook, we're going to need a system in which the non Euro countries of Europe can trade and cooperate in a friendly way and say, Look, you guys have got your project, carry on. You want to hand more power what, what still, fine. What I'm but still we're gonna go in a different path but all stay friends. I'm still struggling with, with, with what a trade deal looks like between the UK and and, and Europe. It's and the EU. I mean, at the end of the day, what we have to do in this country is we have to strike a deal that satisfies every member country and possibly even a number of parliaments within the EU. I don't see how that's going to be done quickly or easily. Um, and, and, and we can, we can hypothesise as much as we like about whether they're going to be friendly to us or unfriendly to us, uh, but that's just guesswork. I mean, we can come up with any, any number of different arguments about that. But at the end of the day, you've already discussed um, in very, very firm terms what you think of the ability of the British civil service to be able to negotiate these deals. This is a very, very big deal we're talking about. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, 48% of our, of our trade, global trade, goes to, um, goes to the, uh, it's, it's with the EU. Um, you know, essentially what, we're, what we are, and, and here's an interesting point, what we're trying to do is uh, what, you know, you want these, these notionally incompetent civil servants to try to negotiate a trade deal that ends up with a uh, with zero tariffs. The reason these zero tariffs are quite important is because if you go for, let's say, a 2.4% tariff on what is it, roughly 200, um, 250 million, a billion pounds worth of, worth of trade, then you can work it out that actually very quickly the tariffs on our trade is going to be slightly more than the, than the net cost of our membership of the EU. So, so You've got to do something pretty clever to make well, it fact, better. If you look at the WTO figures on that, the opposite is the, 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 opposite is the case according to the WTO. The, the um, figures on tariffs are, it's, it's less than the, um, the, the, than the 
than the amount we would save in terms of budgetary contributions. And I can send you the figures on all of that. If you well, like. it depends on the intended measure of growth. But you've already, you've already accepted that... Um, and look, it doesn't matter whether the money comes and goes in or out of the country. The bottom line is the, seven, uh, the 19 billion, we get back 6 billion at some point, even if it doesn't leave the country. So, so we're talking about, what is it, 14 billion uh, net contribution. And then we get back structured funds. Then we get back subsidies to farmers. Then we get back contributions to universities and businesses. And at the end of the day, I can't remember, it's about sort of 4 or 5 billion, 7 billion. For, 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 from memory, the WTO figures are that the, the calculation, or roughly speaking, um, uh, that the tariffs are 7 billion, and, and say you want to take the net figure of 10 to 11 billion, depending on exactly whose net figure you use. Um, so I think the numbers are the way around from, from the way you suggested, but I, haven't, I don't yeah, have yeah, them in front of me. I can send them. We're still talking about farmers. We haven't included farming subsidies in that. We haven't included contributions. That is, that is the net figure. That is included, okay. Yes. But it's very, very marginal, and bear in mind we're trying to increase our trade. So, so yeah. anyway, I taking that number than but Steve Baker and then Stephen Herman. Before I bring in uh, Steve Baker, I just want to first of all clarify, and I should have explained at the start, that neither Matthew Elliott nor Aaron Banks are able to attend today for personal reasons, and we intend to uh, provide another opportunity for them to give evidence as soon as possible. And I'd just like to clarify one point um, that comes out of the evidence you've just been giving. Am I to conclude from what you've said when you talk about by hook or by crook the system's got to change, that were Britain to lead, and were that to lead to the disintegration of the EU in its current form, that would be, um, that would provide opportunities for the better, for the continent and for Britain. In other words, your objective, although your primary objective is Brexit, it is also a fundamental, as a consequence of the Brexit, fundamental reconfiguring of the way the EU operates. Yeah, I wouldn't use the word disintegration myself. It's a, it's a, it's a frightening word. And, no, and it, do it, use the word that you... But I, I think that um, it's certainly the case that, uh, that um, on the 23rd of June, the vote is about what we do. But it will have a, uh, a very big uh, effect on the whole system. And uh, in our view, it will be a very... Uh, good one, because it will force the European Union itself to change. And instead of having this uh, single model invented very, very cleverly by Monet after the war and pursuing it, we will have a more pluralist European system. And pluralism is a good thing. No, I've understood Europe. that point. What I'm, perhaps I should clarify. What I'm trying to obtain your view on is whether you think that process, which you say by hook or by crook, is going to happen anyway will be advanced by Britain's departure. And if so, definitely whether... Definitely. Oh, definitely. And if so, whether if, as a consequence, for a period, which might last several years, there may be considerable disruption. You didn't like the word disintegrate. Uh, that's why I'm offering you the opportunity to choose whichever word you want. Um, Do you that think there's a more need that, of that, disruption? I'm the the to finish what I'm saying. That, that might be a disruption, or whatever word you want to choose, worth paying because we would arrive at a better place uh, in the longer term. Is that your view? Yes. The Brussels system is, is proving disastrous economically and democratically. After we vote leave, it will not just be good for us. It will lead to a significant disruption in the Commission ECJ institutional architecture, and that will be very good for the people of Europe, particularly the people in Southern Europe, who are currently being destroyed by the Euro system. So you think it might collapse, lead to the collapse of the Eurozone, for example, that that might be to the good? I wouldn't necessarily want to say that, but I think the overall, the, the overall institutional structure, they will not be able to, to persevere with relentless centralisation, five presidents report, etc., etc. I understood what it might bring the whole time. Just been pressing all the time to try and understand what we might move towards. Is it a world in which we no longer have the Eurozone, and would that be to the good? Well, as you know, I think it was a profound error to have created it. It now exists. Um, I think that it's not for... Some people on our side think that we should um, try and continue to exercise vetoes over how the Euro works. Yes. We should stay in... I'm not asking all that set of questions about the management of the Eurozone from where we are now. I'm asking a very different question. I'm asking a question about whether 
it would be in our interests, the UK's interest, for the Eurozone uh, to disintegrate or to separate out in, back into constituent currencies? And if so, whether you think that process might be advanced by Brexit? My, 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 my feeling is that, that, that it would not... Uh, well, put, uh, put it in a slightly different way. The Eurozone could end in at least two, broadly speaking, different ways. It could end in a spectacular catastrophic blow-up, causing huge disruption, panic, contagion throughout the system. That would obviously be a disaster not just for them, but for everybody in the world. Or it could end in a slightly different way, as other currency unions have done in the past, where the members get together and say, listen, we screwed this up, we shouldn't have done it, let's try and disentangle ourselves from that. It's conceivable that you could do the second thing in a way which would be to everyone's advantage. But... My, you know, what, I don't know much about this, but my guess is that trying to do the second thing will be extremely difficult. It's one of the tragedies of, of modern Europe, I think, that they created the euro because it ne they're now between a rock and a hard place in terms of what they do. Of course, that's precisely the Delors' point. So, I, can I just get back to... This is one of the reasons that the hearing has taken so long. I just asked two relatively straightforward questions. The first one is, would that acceleration of this reorganisation lead to the breakup of the Eurozone? Would it be likely to? And would we want that? Would that be in Britain's interest? Was that a yes or a no to that one? No. My point, the, 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 your first question was about the EU, and I said that I thought it would force institutional changes in the EU, and that would be for the good. Mm -hmm. Your second question was about the Euro. I think that's a more complicated question. Um, my feeling is that uh, that, that um, that us for to leave would not lead to um, some I immediate disaster with the Eurozone, but it will, in a useful way, clarify thinking about how on earth they reconcile the economic needs of economic and monetary union with the political problem which they've also clearly got. So we would not, it would not be in our interest for the Eurozone to collapse. Correct. Correct. At, Correct. at least not unless okay. it was done in a slow, so gradual, clear, by agreement way. Be not in our interest, in fact. But it would be in our interest that this serve as a wake-up call for some reform of the Eurozone. And were we to leave? Correct. Okay, now I've understood what you were trying to say. Steve Bain. Dominic, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I think for the record I should say, of course, I'm closely associated with Vote Leave. Um, Back in 2007, a British Member of Parliament went to the Czech Republic to make a speech on the EU. He said this, It is the last gasp of an outdated ideology, a philosophy that has no place in our new world of freedom, a world which demands that we fight this bureaucratic overreach and lead Europe into the hope and potential of a new post-bureaucratic age. Do you agree with what the Prime Minister said back in 2007? Roughly speaking... Do you, could you possibly, from your unique perspective, give any insight into why he might have changed his mind? Um, I think that um, I think that David Cameron has never wanted to leave. Uh, I think, well, I think overall, David Cameron's view about the European subject is that the less it's mentioned, the better. He agreed with William Hague, who said it's a bomb, and let's try and stop the bomb going off. Uh, and therefore, for many years, his uh, main goal was simply um, not to talk about it. Um, I, I remember before the 2010 election, the unit which, the, which he created to think about government was explicitly stopped from thinking about EU affairs, which hampered a lot of preparations for, for, for government, because he simply didn't want people thinking about it. It would only lead to trouble. Um, so I think, uh, overall, that's been David Cameron's uh, attitude. Um, also, David Cameron is, uh, is uh, psychologically someone who goes along with conventional wisdom of the establishment. So I think, think I personally am not at all surprised and, uh, that he's on the other side of this debate. So another kind of bureaucracy is, of course, the large multinational corporation. And you weren't able to complete what I thought was a very interesting answer earlier to Helen Goodman. Would, would you like to finish uh, your answer on how these large multinational companies operate? Um, well, the, there's a basic problem of power in how the European Union works and its regulatory system. Um, and there are all, there, there's huge scope for corruption. This is not particularly a point just about the European Union, it's a general point about how the world works. That if you centralise a huge amount of power in a place like Brussels, 
where you, know, you don't have Britain's tradition of the free press, uh, you don't have an awful lot of scrutiny, you don't have any kind of democratic control, you don't have pluralist inst institutions, you have very centralised uh, ins institutions, you inevitably get a lot of nepotism between big business and politicians. And that is one of the uh, most unfortunate, disagreeable aspects of the, of the European Union. But it also puts a lot of these companies in a bind, and I experienced this on, uh, on the Euro campaign. A lot of them say to you privately, of course the Euro is a bloody stupid idea, of course we shouldn't be in it. But if I come out and say that, I've had a phone call from Tony Blair at Downing Street that says, my business in North Africa is up the spout, so very sorry I can't do anything about it. That happened repeatedly on the Euro campaign. It's happened repeatedly throughout this campaign as well. Calls go out from Jeremy Haywood's office and the Cabinet office to people saying, you don't want to be on that side or bad things might happen to you. Uh, and think of how much worse that is in Brussels. If you're an airline, like British Airways or whoever, and you've got to negotiate your landing spots with the European Commission, what do you think the odds are that the board of a company in that situation is going to say, oh yeah, don't worry, Charlie, go out on TV and tell everyone how rubbish the EU is? It doesn't happen. I'm sorry to interrupt again. Just for clarification, when you say, when you talk about Jeremy Haywood there, you're suggesting Jeremy Haywood is ringing people up and, 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 and threatening them, saying, you don't want to be on that side lest bad things happen to you. All sorts of people in the Cabinet Office call people all the time and make um, uh, uh, threats, some more overt and some more covert. I don't want to say that Jeremy Haywood himself has particularly and specifically done anything, but everyone close to how government operates knows the power of the Cabinet Office and the power of the Cabinet Secretary and the power of subtly worded in a very English way, threats. So the Cabinet Office, we're not naming any particular individuals, but we are talking about senior officials are making threats all the time with respect to this referendum. Certainly, and people are number 10. Uh, by which you mean who? Or at least which category of person, if you don't want I to I mean, both them. officials and special advisors as part of what their job description is. To make threats? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've had very clear answers on that point. Steve Baker, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. That's right. Can we turn to these, let's turn then to these um, government documents. They've produced five documents from the best of both worlds, so called uh, alternatives to membership, uh, process for withdrawing, rights and obligations, and the Treasury uh, economic analysis, which we'll talk about most. Um, could you just, before we get started, just contrast the resources available to the Vote Leave campaign with the resources available to government in the production of all these documents? I mean, um, I couldn't do that very accurately, but you know, we've got roughly a staff of 70, um, but they have to do all sorts of different things from campaign events to you name it. Um, there's a massive asymmetry. Document. There's a massive asymmetry. Yeah. And do you think it was material that the government has uh, waded in with this additional leaflet and um, website? Do you think it's what? Do you think it's material to the campaign that they've waded in with this leaflet and website before the formal further period? Um, I think it was. Uh, um, I think it would have been better if taxpayers' money had not been spent on uh, on what's essentially propaganda. Um, on the other hand, I do think it's reasonable for the Treasury to do to to, 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 to do various kinds of analyses on these. And I also wouldn't mind the Treasury publishing documents that said, um, uh, you know, we've looked at all of this in the round, we've taken a proper look at it, we've invited in different people, serious people, to look at it, and here's our considered conclusions. I think that would be reasonable too. Um, the report on Monday, though, is obviously not that kind of report. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's something else. Just to run through each of these very briefly, the first one is the best of both worlds, which is claiming we've got a special status in a reformed European Union. Obviously, I've read Vote Leave research on it. Can you just characterise Vote Leave's position on this claim that we've had a reformed European Union with a special status for the UK? I think that... Um, it, it, all you really have to do is look at, if you, if, if you look at what the government's deal is, it is very clear that it changes approximately nothing of any seriousness in terms of our relationship with the European Union. Uh, if you go back and compare all the things that the Prime Minister promised he would do over the years, all the things he said he would change, approx almost none of them have actually been changed. The most obvious example probably is the Charter of Fundamental Rights in 2009. He guaranteed that we would have, quote, a total opt-out, unquote. 
And of course, uh, he didn't even ask for anything to change. Never mind did he get anything to change. Um, that gives the ECJ power to interfere in practically anything that they want to from now on. So uh, the idea that he's changed the European Union system, uh, I think, is laughable. Uh, the idea that, um, that, 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 well, there's also a more fundamental legal point about his deal. His deal is completely subject to what the European Court of Justice decides to do. And we've had a perfect example of this before. The Danes thought that they negotiated a new deal in 1992, all signed in exactly the same way as David Cameron's deal has been signed. And the Danes went home and thought, oh, well, we've got a few things back, great. And the ECJ looked at it and said, no, we don't like that. We're tearing it up. The ECJ will decide how much of David Cameron's already pathetic deal survives the MINSA. And the history is the ECJ interprets all of these things in a way that enhances the power of the ECJ. On the alternatives to membership possible models for the UK outside, do you think it rises to the challenge of uh, the UK's relationship to <laughs> Europe? Or do you think it, it, you've talked about quite a significant reordering of the European uh, system of nation states? Uh, do, do you think the alternatives to membership paper even comes close to uh, meeting the challenge of the, the days we face? No, I don't. I think they could have looked at all sorts of other things, but uh, that presupposes that they're looking at a balanced analysis rather than just producing propaganda, and it's obvious they're just producing propaganda. I think you've touched earlier in earlier evidence on the process for withdrawing, so I won't um, ask you about that unless you want to make any particular observations you haven't covered already. Rights and obligations more or less states the process, uh, the, the current um, situation. So if we turn to this HM Treasury analysis, it claims that... Um, in 2015 terms, leaving the EU for a negotiated bilateral agreement would imply a long-term loss of GDP of £4,300 a year for each household in the UK, and great fanfare was made of that claim. From your perspective, do, does this conclusion, and indeed the, the other similar conclusions of the document, do those conclusions follow from the argument that's been set out? I don't think they do, but then I think that the whole methodology involved with these documents is intellectually spurious. Um, if you look at the, 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 the these modelling uh, processes are um, based on ideas of what's known as quote general equilibrium unquote which has been an idea uh, in economics going back decades um, these are all the same models that, uh, that uh, constantly fail to predict the world um, this is not the forum to go into it, but I would uh, anyone in, anyone inclined to take seriously this kind of modelling should go and read what Nobel Prize winning physicists say about the about these sort of models. They're garbage. Uh, these general equilibrium models uh, are not constructed in a way that make accurate forecasts about anything, uh, and therefore I would not take them seriously. Overall, there's a general there's a general point about them, which is they're saying what happens to we think the trade and investment, the freer trade and more investment flows are a good thing. I agree with the Treasury about that. Um, that's an uncontroversial view. They are assuming that, any, that, that over the next 15 years, Britain's trading relationships and investment relationships with the EU will be less free and less liberal than they are now. And uh, in my opinion, that's, a, that's at least an arguable assumption. I think it's a, it's a wrong assumption. And therefore, the modelling does not follow even if you agree with their, um, their, their modelling methodology, which I think is not actually serious. After we've won, I'll look forward to discussing the flaws in these models with you. But um, just um, to, to, to conclude, are there any particular assumptions laying behind this document which you particularly would want to challenge? Bearing in mind we have the Chancellor coming in to discuss it shortly. No, I have a personal uh, dislike for, the, for these studies that, that, that produce numbers like there's going to be £4,318 better off. It implies a kind of spurious precision uh, to predictions where, where the, it doesn't exist and, and the predictions are bogus. So um, variously in the press I've seen suggestions that this report's being constructed to meet the Chancellor's requirements and expectations for what it should say. Do you think there's any justification in that claim? I think th th they're almost deconstructed in a, in a political way. The Chancellor's uh, future is at stake. Um, he's got the resources of the Treasury. He's done what lots of people do in his position, which is use the resources for his own political ends. Dominic, thanks very much. Stephen Hatton. Thank, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Director. Thank you for giving evidence this afternoon. Um, I think I'm going to try and play the... Uh, committee sweeper, if you like. There are a few areas where we open up questions, perhaps didn't finish 
Can we just start with some, some, some com your thoughts on free trade agreements, uh, going back to that? Can we be clear that, uh, obviously, if we were to leave on June 23rd, we would no longer, we would, after we've left at some stage, we would have to renegotiate uh, our trade agreements that are currently negotiated by the EU? That's correct. So say, say that again. Well, at some period after we have left, yeah. and whatever that process is, and you've discussed yeah. it as we spoke, we would have to start put in place a system of trade agreements with non-EU with non-EU uh, countries, because at the moment all of our non-EU trade agreements are effectively through uh, the EU. Yes. So at the, at the moment, there's a set of negotiations that would be conducted by the EU on our behalf. Um, um, and after we leave, we will have to go through a process of figuring out how best we organise our relations with, uh, with the rest of the world. But there are lots of different ways which we could try and sure. do that. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we've got, we've, so we're both agreeing on that point. Um, could you just, say, for a matter of record, then say which uh, country, in terms of the trade process, you'd like to em us to emulate in terms of what they've achieved? And also, what, if any, country has more trade arrangements with other countries outside its own trading area than the EU has currently? I don't think there's any, sp uh, any particular country. Britain's in a unique position in the European Union um, I I I in all sorts of ways, we have, uh, in terms of our legal system, in terms of our position in NATO, the UN Security Council, uh, history, all sorts of things. So I'm surprised so I, don't think, I don't think there's, any th 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 there's not any country which we should go, let's cut and paste their agreement. Fine. I think that's quite helpful because of a lot of people suggesting there are certain rules we could we could cut and paste. Uh, and the final point on this, uh, the, well, the two more points, but the first point I asked you a moment ago was, could you tell me which, if any, country or regional grouping has a more extensive network of trade arrangements than the EU currently existing? So I'm, I'm, I'm being very slow. I didn't follow your question. Well, the EU has a number of trade agreements that we get dealt at. Uh, they, get, they negotiate on our behalf. Yes. We have a number of preferential agreements with countries throughout the world yes. as a result of being a member of the EU. Rightly, we've agreed that we would have to renegotiate those relationships ourselves. Is there any other country in the world that currently has a longer, a, a greater set of arrangements and trade arrangements that the EU has in place at the moment? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. So if I was to tell you it was no, is that... You know, it tends to argue that the process for renegotiating our trade agreements is going to be longer than the process that's currently in place and longer than the process that uh, and likely to be less beneficial than if we were to stay in the EU. Well, that assumes you have to redo everything from the start. I don't think that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, these things already exist. Uh, various countries like Korea and whatnot have already said that uh, if we do vote leave, that we'll, we'll keep going with the current arrangements. So I don't think it's not, it's not the case that we have but to do all the work that's already been done. And I think that's a perfectly fair, uh, a perfectly fair summary. But there is also clear that a number of countries would want us to start new, complete, entirely new bilateral arrangements. That, 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 that may happen. We'll have to see, won't we? So if one of those bilateral agreements, so let's turn it, flip it the other way around, in terms of the trade agreements with with the EU. Uh, and we look at it, and although we've agreed that we don't want to emulate any particular country, say we were to take the Canada style of trade agreements, um, can you, the problem with, the problem with some of these agreements is that do you envisage how would the, EU, how would the UK um, not have to emulate or follow the standards that are already set inside the EU with one of those trade agreements? Because either we have to say, trade with us and you've got to accept our standards, or we have to say, we'll trade with you but we're going to buy your standard. Yeah, we accept your standards. And that just seems to me that we're not doing anything in terms of the regulatory burden, which is a key part of your argument. So I think, I th I think you're, you're, you're far too clever for me, and I can't, I can't follow your, 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 your questions at all. No, really. I'm probably far too stupid, which is probably the problem. But um, let me try one more time. So, flip it, we, we've, we've talked about trade agreements as if with non-EU companies. I'm now saying we've agreed already that... Um, we don't have one to follow any particular country in terms of that style of trade agreement. But mm -hmm. I'm saying for a lot of trade, uh, trade based agreements, we will have to make a decision. Uh, we will trade with the EU. I think that's pretty clear. I mean, you know, we don't need to worry about what Project Fear is saying about that. But we will trade with the EU. But 
we would have to make a decision, won't we, saying these are our standards and we're going to export them into the EU, or we're going to say here are the EU standards, we're going to change our model to adopt those EU standards. And what I'm not clear about, because I think, and I'll come on to it again in a moment, you, one of your key arguments is that the regu- one of the good reasons here is we get the chance to set our own regulatory burden. And all I'm saying to you is that under that trade agreement, we don't seem to be making any pre- we don't seem to be changing the status quo or to any benefit in the regulatory burden. Um, I think I think uh, I think a, cu- a couple of a couple of points. Um, uh, one is, as I said before, increasingly the, the rules are being set at the global level. So one of the great advantages of voting to leave is that we will reclaim our seat where we're currently represented by the European Union and make our case at the global level for where these regulations should be. And we will be interrupted sort of higher in the food chain, so to speak. So if this is the global level, and here's Britain and here's the European Union, instead of fighting and losing in a system here at the European level where we only have about 8% of the votes and the Eurozone has a majority, we will regain our voice here and influence the things that are passed down. So I think that will be one great advantage to, 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 to the country after we, uh, after we vote to leave. Um, but also I think that overall you'll have a more flexible economy because... The relatively small section of the economy, which sells things to Europe, will obviously have to sell, will obviously have to abide by the rules that the European Union wants to set. But all of the other businesses will not be stuck with those rules. So the whole system, uh, some of it crazy, which regulates intra-EU trade, we will be able to dispense with a large portion of it. Yes, if you're exporting to Sicily, you're going to have to obey certain rules there. But if you're exporting to California or to Asia or to something else, you won't have to. And no, that that's, be that, that is, that's, the current, that's where we are now. But I think you've, you've just said we will, have to, we will have to obey the standards that are set in the EU if we want to export into them. And it doesn't seem to me that we're making a great deal of progress on the regulatory burden, if that's the case. For, for a small proportion of the, of the economy, we will have to abide by the EU standards. For the rest of the economy, we won't. And with respect, uh, that, that the situation I described is not the situation now. At the moment, 100% of British businesses have to comply with 100% of European Union regulation. We've got more to come? Well, we've got a lot more to come, but... Uh, uh-huh. okay. well, I'll think, one more. Mr Chairman, sorry, can I just make one point? Um, obviously, originally, I was only asked to come in for, for an hour, and I've um, had, because the other guests have, haven't turned up, I've stayed to answer more questions. Oh, no, two more colleagues I've now missed to at least one set of meetings, now I'm about to miss another set well, of meetings. I'm afraid that's what happens when Parliament calls. Stephen Hammond, have you got any more? Well, well, well I very quick, very, okay, very quick. I mean, we, we spoke, um, in response to Mr Garnier, you spoke a lot about, um, I think, the financial sector, or it may have been to Mr. Uh, Richard Reeves, about the financial services sector. We have two um, people from large you know, banks, call them what you will, and I know you're sceptical of that. But they, bo- they both said in explicit on-the-record evidence to us that notwithstanding the point you rightly make that London has been a great success for a period, actually, since the period that we've been in the EU, London, London has seen even greater financial strength and its financial centre um, status has been, has been enhanced. Should the committee take, take it that those uh, individuals are either misguided or misrepresenting, misrepresenting the facts to this committee? Uh, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily impugn, impugn their, 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 their motives, um, not knowing who, who they are. Um, uh, different elements in the city have very different views about the European Union, as you know. Uh, big American investment banks have a particular view about the European Union, but, all, but that's also very much affected by their own structure. These big American banks have a structure in which they can use the European passporting system to exploit the European market whilst being outside the European Union rules for their bases in Asia and in New York. In lots of ways, that's quite a convenient setup if you are Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. Uh, as you will know, and having talked to a lot of these people, uh, a, a lot of other organisations have a, have a different view in the city. There's all sorts of different companies. So I don't think you can say, here is the city view. There is a big bank right. view. There is we a hedge fund view. The are, city UK. We are going to have to move on, and I understand you've been going some time. So, uh, 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 
Um, West Street, we'll come back to that point. George Caravan and then West Street. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Cummings. It's, I think it's probably good evening. Um, uh, you, you used an interesting phrase when you were uh, answering questions to Chris Phil. Uh, you said that uh, a Brexit, a leaving of the UK leaving the Euro European Union, would add to, be part of, would reinforce, uh, use your phrase, national renewal. Um, is that your personal view or is that something that infuses the whole campaign officially? I think, all, I think um, almost everybody involved with our campaign thinks that, uh, that um, if we vote to leave, it will be uh, an important part of national renewal, but also, um, as I said before, also very good for Europe too. So... This is a political project, not a free trade project. So the EU is a free trade project, or no, the, my the, 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 the Leave campaign is 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 a, is, a, is proposing a political project in, in a grander scale, rather than simply a vision of free trade. Um, yeah, I suppose that I suppose that's that's roughly speaking a reasonable summary. Yes. Right. So. Criticism of the EU as a political project rather than as a free trade zone is rather displaced that because you're doing the same thing but with a different ideological model. I don't think so. I think I, I think we're, we're, we're making an overall argument that um, the, the the EEC was set up in a certain way by Jean Monnet and his friends. It's developed and evolved in a certain way. We think it's been very damaging economically and democratically. And after we vote leave, it will be good both for our economy and for our democracy, but also it will be a, a, a beneficial step for our friends in Europe at the same time. I think it's a reasonable, you might not agree with it, but it's a right, right. reasonable... So, so it's you, you have a broader philosophical model, which seems to me, again, given that yourself, Mr. Gould, uh, the mayor... Jesus uh, Stewart. That, that, that seems... The, 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 the intellectual heavyweights, the, the leadership, seem to me to be uh, broadly sympathetic with a worldview which is um, liberal in the 19th century, uh, free trade in the 19th century, which in the UK had it, um, smaller government, uh, closer relationship uh, with the United States, uh, Australia, Canada. Would that be correct? Uh, only, uh, uh, only partly. I think that most of the people involved in our campaign think that free trade is a good thing and it should be extended and it's been a good thing for the poorest people in the world. Um, our, our campaign is very much not, however, about a smaller state. That's not, that's not true. Obviously, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson have their own particular views. There's a campaign. It is not vote Lee's position that we should be cutting taxes and cutting public spending. But I, mean, I, do, I do find it difficult sometimes to distinguish between uh, your personal vision on your website and uh, Mr. Gove, which is, which I'm not at this moment be saying yes or no to that vision. There seems to be a, quite a, quite a, there's quite a, a nuanced vision there, and that much of what you are arguing will come from a Brexit uh, is actually to facilitate that broader view of the state and the individual and the role of the individual in the state. Well, you know, we have Frank Field and Gisela Stewart and Graham Stringer and uh, other very senior and well-respected members of the Labour Party who who agree with us about, about free trade. And as I stressed, the campaign is not about um, uh, about the benefits of, uh, of um, deregulation and, and, and whatnot. Okay. That's not our agenda. Well, so, so, well OK, well, then, I'm, I'm simply trying to, to get a sense of what, what the campaign really needs because... Where you have now gone is say that it's not about deregulation, and that would seem to be what you, that seems to be logical. That that uh, from what you just said, that voting to leave the EU um, would simply, therefore, um, uh, in some sense, leave the UK uh, free to decide its own regulatory regime. But by definition, therefore, it could choose uh, to keep the same regulatory regime as we have at the moment, or to toughen it. Yes. Correct, and it may well be the view that uh, that, that in various ways, for example, um, there could easily be a cross-party consensus that after we leave the European Union, there should be far greater investment in fundamental science research. Could easily be the case that we take global environmental okay, things I, much more seriously. I'll take, I'll take those examples, but 
so much of the uh, documentation that you present in the Leave campaign to justify Brexit mm -hmm. is premised on uh, the regulatory burden that Europe places on us and that we could remove that regulatory burden. It seems to me, is there not a contradiction between what you have, the evidence you have just given, which is the fundamental thrust of the campaign is not about regulation or deregulation, it's about the freedom to decide, but we have the freedom to decide to keep the burden of regulation, or change it or modify it. And if that is so, then, the, then presenting the evidence which you do in terms of uh, reducing uh, uh, financially or reducing for companies regulatory burden, there's a contradiction there. With, with, with respect, I don't think that's an accurate description of how, of how the campaign operates. If you look at the last um, at the, at the leaf that we sent round, uh, which has had by far the biggest distribution of anything else we've done, to millions and millions of households, uh, it, it says nothing in there about cutting the burden of regulation. It, our, our, our point is, is we've been back control of regulation and we have greater influence at the global level over regulation, but it's not about cutting specific regulations. Okay. Right, so, so any, any numbers, any financial numbers given in any of your literature uh, that suggest that um, uh, there would be financial savings from reducing the regulation, but we should discount those because they're not germane to the central argument we're putting forward. Can I just clarify inside? Sorry to interrupt. You've mentioned a leaflet that's had far greater circulation than any other leaflet that you've put out so far in the did you supply that to the committee when we asked you to supply your campaign literature? Uh, I assume I, I didn't send over the package. I assume that it's been sent to you. I don't know if you show if you show me now all the things you've been sent. Well, I'll tell you. If we're not going to do that. Uh, that would take a, a great deal of time. Uh, but I think it would be helpful if, as campaign director, you make sure that when a parliamentary committee asks you for literature, that you're uh, and you're going to be giving oral evidence, you make absolutely sure you know what's been put in front of us because we quite reasonably asking questions on the basis of what we understand to be in that literature. And sure. you seem to be giving the impression that a piece of literature to which you've just referred, widely circulated, doesn't contain those numbers. So, um, so I, I, I'm assuming that you've got it in front of you. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you haven't got it in front of you. I'm assuming that you have got it in front of you. I'm suggesting you might not have sent it to us. That's what I'm suggesting, but I don't know for sure. So I'd be grateful if you go back if and... If you don't run the pack, I'd you straight away. I'd order, order. order. I'd be grateful if you'd go back after this hearing, make sure uh, that everything that should be sent to us under the terms of our request uh, be passed to us immediately so that we have it by first thing tomorrow. George Caravan. Yes, yeah, so, well, I've mean, forgotten your original question now, I'm afraid. Well, uh, you the, vote, the, vote, uh, the, you, you, the vote the briefing document, the single market is failing British business, about time. Uh, says that uh, the cost of the UK's budget contributions to the EU and the burden of just 66 of the EU's single market regulations mm -hmm. outweighed what the European Commission claims are the benefits of the single market by 4.5 billion. In other words, that seems to suggest in, in your campaign literature that you are placing an emphasis on what you claim would be the savings from removing a regulatory burden. And I'm just trying to clarify, you are now telling me that actually the issue of the, the cost of regulation is not the key thing you're arguing, it's not germane. In fact, what you're arguing is simply the democratic right to set regulations in this parliament. Uh, but, we, but therefore, if this parliament then chose, after a, a hypothetical meeting with you, to keep the regulatory burdens in areas or increase it, that would be fine. Yes. The, the, the overall argument we make is that we should take back control. The particular argument we were making there is not about the cost of the single market. The point, the, the point we we're making there is that the Commission's own numbers don't stack up in the in campaign's numbers don't stack up in their own terms. It's not about oh well, if we should therefore get rid of all of these things. It's that if you look at how they make the argument, it doesn't stack up given their own predictions. I, 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 I take that 